Okay, good morning. I'm uh, Trina Wally. I'm the executive director for the East Stanislaus Resource Conservation District, and we've partnered with your Madera Chachilla Resource Conservation District to bring uh, workshops and various uh, programs to Madera County. Um, and I am going to cover some of those in my presentation. All right. So hopefully everybody can see my slides. <clears throat> so just a few highlights of what your Madera Chowchilla Resource Conservation District has, um, has in the works or um, currently uh, going in Madera County. Um, the Resource Conservation District is a um, organization that's your local representative. And so it is uh, their job to be a resource to the landowners, farmers, ranchers, um, on anything that's resource concern related. Uh, so they are, they've been working on a few community programs, uh, water quality resources for residents, for example, uh, river cleanup days, um, volunteer plantings uh, for monarch habitat and riparian restoration. Uh, but uh, since Madera is a large um, agricultural county, of course, a lot of the programs are um, aimed at the agricultural uh, side. Um, so they have a cover crop program that they got started uh, several years ago, and they are working on developing more uh, trainings in the future regarding cover crops. Uh, pollinator hedgerows and monarch habitat um, is a program also that they have recently been able to secure funding for to do more of. Um, the staff is currently in training and one of the partnerships that we've developed is to develop a mobile irrigation lab so that the RCD can provide irrigation evaluations and workshops on irrigation management. Uh, they've had an ag plastic recycling uh, program um, and then a lot of this presentation is going to be about this last one and that's conservation planning. Um, so a lot of the programs uh, came about um, during the drought of 2014. Uh, there was a lot of um, questions around soil health and how um, our farmers and ranchers could do uh, more to manage their waters um, and their soils. Uh, so around that same time is when um, the RCDs uh, worked on consolidation uh, so that they could bring together their boards and uh, continue to offer uh, more services to their uh, farmers and ranchers. Uh, a lot of the programs, again, a lot of the funding that is available to resource conservation districts are really uh, centered around drought resiliencies, um, resources for residents and cover crop trainings. Um, so the mission statement for the Madera Chachilla Resource Conservation District is they're really working to become a go-to hub for natural resource conservation and agriculture on public and private lands in Madera County. Um, and so Amy is doing a great job of bringing uh, partners together to be able to provide services to your farmers and ranchers in Madera County. Uh, one of those services, in fact, I believe we're going out uh, next week um, for an irrigation evaluation. That's one of the key uh, tools in a mobile irrigation lab uh, where we have staff that goes out and does a, a full evaluation on the irrigation system. Again, this ties back into the drought resiliency. Um, uh, our program in Stanislaus County got started during the past drought um, and there was a lot of uh, requests for the evaluations. And um, uh, this past year, we've seen an, an, another uptick in uh, irrigation evaluations, um, again, all related to managing your water. So in these irrigation evaluations, we uh, follow the Cal Poly um, ITRC distribution uh, uniformity test. We've also uh, looked into flow uniformity, irrigation scheduling, and the farmers and get a full report with all the documents we go when uh, we pull their soil reports and their soil holding capacity, uh, we pull their uh, specs for the equipment uh, to make sure that they are using it to, the, uh, to its fullest potential. Uh, and a big part of what we've seen is that maintenance is a key word um, 
in keeping those irrigation systems working. We've seen a lot of irrigation systems uh, that have been brought back online this year with the uh, decreased water allotments. And uh, it's obvious that those systems have not been used in the past uh, two to three years uh, as a main way of uh, irrigating. I'm sure they were flooding. Um, and the, the operational side, the distribution uniformity of the systems um, from lack of maintenance over those two years uh, really shows in the, the uniformity test. So conservation planning is uh, the next step of what the Resource Conservation District wants to be able to um, add uh, services to their farmers and ranchers. Uh, conservation planning is really about um, the ones that have come to us in Stanislaus County, really it's been about uh, providing a sustainability for their farms and ranches for the next generation. Uh, but a lot of the things that we do on the conservation planning side uh, have other benefits. Um, for example, market access, uh, maybe it's a processor requirement, a buyer's a certification, something that's uh, encouraging the farm or ranch to, to look towards conservation practices. Um, we've One of the conservation uh, planning that we do um, is carbon farm planning, which is looking at the carbon sequestration that you can do through various conservation practices on your farm and ranch. And that's really looking at future market access. So there's currently an ecosystem marketplace that's in development as well as a carbon exchange. And having a carbon farm plan provides the opportunity for those farms and ranches to be ready for when those marketplaces come, come online to access additional funding for their farms. And of course, anything that's funding for farm improvements, whether it's infrastructure or um, increasing yields, um, a lot of those come through various programs such as uh, CDFA State Water and Energy Efficiency Program. That application just opened um, last week. And so uh, if you have questions, uh, various partners with the Madera Chachilla RCD can provide technical assistance. Um, so that you can help uh, secure funding to implement water and energy conservation practices. And that's funded by the CDFA Climate Smart Agriculture. Uh, the RCD has also secured monarch and pollinator habitat funding to do demonstration sites and training. So they're looking for sites to implement for implementation of habitat, um, funding to implement pollinator hedgerows and cover crops. And, those uh, fundings come through various sources, uh, Seed for Bees, Xerces Society, and CDFA Fish and Wildlife. Um, and all of this is brought through our state association that pulls us all together so that we can uh, get funding on the local level. Uh, the big part is our partnerships for the technical assistance uh, because I believe uh, the Madera Chachilla is a staff of one. So uh, Amy really needs her partnerships to be able to bring all of these services. Uh, uh, to your local landowners as you guys build your capacity. So there's the CDFA sweep. Uh, there's also the Healthy Soils program that will be coming out soon. Again, uh, Almond Board of California, the sustainability program uh, helped uh, fund this workshop, for example, Department of Water Resources and Department of Conservation. Um, through one of the main partners is the USDA Natural Resource Conservation Service. And that's really the conservation planning format that we follow at the RCD to assist our farmers and ranchers. Um, so the conservation plans not only help with the other types of funding programs, but um, all of the various NRCS funding programs such as EQIP, uh, Conservation Stewardship Program, Conservation Incentive Program, um, and the Regional Conservation Partnership Program. And that's a big one that's here uh, coming up for the San Joaquin Valley. There's five counties uh, that are included in that. And these other funds, usually you have to compete on a statewide level. But with the Regional Conservation Partnership Program, you're only competing with the five counties that are participating in that program. And so it's really going to be a benefit to our local landowners. And so with that, it was just a quick overview of the various programs and funding opportunities and what the Madera Chachilla RCD is working on to provide to you guys. Um, and um, Stacy will be covering more on the Regional Conservation Partnership Program. Hi, should I go ahead and share my screen? Is that yes, I, I did mine. Great. Okay, thanks, Tina. I have a quick question. Oh, sure. 
Okay. Thank you. You mentioned we're from Madera County. Any, any quarterback that's similar or available in Fresno or Merced County? So uh, Merced, um, East Merced Resource Conservation District is currently um, uh, partnering with this as well. And then uh, Sierra uh, Resource Conservation District in Eastern um, Fresno County is participating. Uh, so the five counties, uh, Stacy, I think you have that in your presentation, are um, Stanislaus, Merced, Madera, Fresno, and Tulare counties. Okay, thank you, Trina. Um, so we have a hand raised by Justin Morgan. Um, let me allow him to talk. Hi, Justin. Hey, good morning. Thanks, Amy. I, I just uh, heard the question and just wanted to uh, take the opportunity to, um, yeah, drop, uh, Trina mentioned it, but yeah, drop Sierra RCD's name. We are uh, based here in Fresno County and, uh, yeah, working as part of this partnership and I'm going to drop my uh, contact information in the chat, and hopefully you can share that with everybody that's there in the room as well. Okay, perfect, Justin. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Okay, Stacy, if you want to take your presentation over, that'd be great. Great. Yeah. Can you all see my screen? Yes. Okay. Great. Well, thanks for having me, Amy, and everybody who organized this. Uh, my name is Stacy Schutz. I'm with American Farmland Trust, and I work um, in the Climate and Agriculture Program. And um, my colleague, Paul Lum, who's an agricultural specialist and a farmer, um, he was not able to make it today, but he's one of the other folks um, who are working pretty directly on this RCPP. So I'm going to talk to you today about the, the Conservation Collaborative and the RCPP. So um, the RCPP is a regional conservation partnership program with the Natural Resources Conservation Service. It's a five-year award that includes technical assistance and financial assistance. And the foundation of this RCPP, the, the folks who are going to deliver the, you know, the outcomes um, intended of the, of the award is the Conservation Collaborative. And that's the San Joaquin Valley Land and Water Conservation Collaborative. That's made up of uh, nine different partners listed here. And like Trina mentioned, from north to south, there's Stanislaus County, Merced, Madera, Fresno, and Tulare. And so there's an RCD in each of those. Um, uh, yeah, each of those counties, um, we're still working in Tulare to kind of um, figure that situation out, but it'll be the, the scope of the geography will be those five counties. And, uh, and then we have two technology partners that are assisting um, the, the technical assistance part and, uh, and one additional land trust in addition to American Farmland Trust. And so that's California Farmland Trust. And then of course, NRCS is a partner in this award. So the goals of the collaborative are to protect and steward ag land. Uh, and we can do that through as Trina described, uh, conservation practices and also conservation easements and also uh, land rental opportunities for farmers who are looking to transition or repurpose their, their ground. Um, and then the other purpose is to increase the capacity of technical assistance providers like, like the partners at the RCDs. And then the third goal is to reach new and underserved farming communities throughout the Central Valley. So those two technology partners that I've mentioned are the Conservation Biology Institute in this first paragraph listed, and they have helped uh, American Farmland Trust um, create a mapping tool that's a web-based mapping tool. And uh, we can insert new layers and like modify different layers that are in there so that we can see where to prioritize land throughout the valley. Um, and you know, so that there's layers that include prime farmland, groundwater recharge, um, we can you know, include by crop type, things like that. Um, and then the second partner is the Freshwater Trust, which has a platform called Basin Scout, and that even further helps us refine our understanding of uh, parcels that would be cost effective with certain conservation practices. Uh, so that, that one will be um, specifically piloted in Madera County for this, uh, um, for the funding that's available in the RCPP. Uh, these next two slides just go through the major deliverables of the RCPP. So um, these first two are related to conservation practices. And this is a lot of the meat of um, the deliverables. So we're going to be implementing uh, about 23,000 acres of conservation practices. And so 
the RCDs and AFT, we all need to know who is out there and interested to implement conservation practices. And I'll, I'll share with you a list of the 12 practices that are prioritized. Um, as many of you know, there's hundreds actually of conservation practices, but they've been narrowed down for this project to a list of 12. Um, and then those will help generate to the conservation plans that will that we'll have with producers. Um, they can understand based on, on their goals and their resource concerns. Looking to place two to four um, uh, farms under uh, conservation easements, and that's you know voluntary and um, you know at the again just at the interest of the landowner to engage with a land trust. Um, to, to place a conservation easement on their property, which essentially um, through state and federal funding can provide them with about 30 to 40% of the value of their land um, in exchange for essentially the development rights um, and the protection of their property as ag land uh, in perpetuity. And then we'll also be identifying 10 additional locations where uh, there's high groundwater recharge potential that would be very suitable for agricultural conservation easements. So again, this slide just goes through the conservation practices and the conservation easements. Um, this next one just, I had mentioned the land rental opportunities. And so there is uh, financial assistance that will support uh, 700 acres of land rentals. And um, it's very interesting talking with different groups throughout the valley. I realized how how small this number can look compared to the acreage uh, that may need this kind of support, but um, you know it is it is nonetheless there and um, and will support those uh, voluntary and interested farmers um, who are looking to repurpose parts or whole of their or whole of their land. Um, and then these last three are more related to outreach. Um, so three economic, social, and uh, case studies on. Um, the adoption of those conservation practices uh, in hopes that that is one mechanism that some producers may be uh, you know, more willing or interested to adopt conservation practices by seeing the economic value or the social value. And then uh, we'll work on three to four workshops with, um, with partners and with producers in the Valley. And then um, this last one mentions, you know, we will leverage um, some of American Farmland Trust's current programming on uh, working with underserved farmers, which includes an underserved farmer outreach program and very specifically a Women for the Land Learning Circle program. Um, so those are, in a quick nutshell, the deliverables um, of the RCPP. And, you know, Trina mentioned really well what, what the conservation plan is intended to do. And so this will be a first step to meet with producers who are interested to engage and go to their land, visit, and see what their goals and their resource concerns are. There's no obligation to proceed with EQIP funding, um, but it is, uh, you know, it is the intention to, to, for these to lead to those, uh, the implementation of those conservation practices. And so these next two slides go over those conservation practices. Really briefly, you'll see, um, You'll see a few related to uh, cover cropping, critical area planning, conservation cover. You'll see a few related to till, so no till, reduced till. Um, and then we have one for irrigation water and wildlife habitat management. And of course, these vary by county and by location, uh, you know, what are most or should be most prioritized. And of course, they also vary by farm. Um, so we recognize that. And then these last few are related to conveyance and the two new practices on farm recharge and groundwater recharge basins. Um, and so the, the three before that, the irrigation pipeline, pumping plant, and structure for water control are those conveyance mechanisms that can support the, um, those new practices, the recharge. Um, so these are the 12 practices that we're looking to uh, you know, provide technical assistance and financial assistance for. And the RCDs and AFT will be those facilitators working with landowners um, to get these practices in place and then very closely as well with NRCS and the DCs um, to, to have that follow through and to, to have those applications for EQIP go through. Um, and as you mentioned, there is like, so this financial assistance we keep talking about, there's a specific pot of money set aside through the RCBP um, for, the, for this five county region. So that helps in terms of the competition, which depending on which location folks are in, 
about one in three of these applications, you know, get approved for, for the funding, you know, something in that range. Um, but nonetheless, it, uh, you know, it can, it can help. And so, um, so this is my contact info. Uh, as I said, Paul Lum, who, who couldn't be here today, he's um, another, another point of contact at American Farmland Trust. And of course, if you're a producer, um, you know, in one of these counties, you, you have your RCDs to reach out to as well. So um, more than happy to speak with folks and, um, and answer any questions at this time. So thank you. Have any questions for Stacy or anything? I think we're good, Stacy. Thank you so much for your presentation. Thank you, Amy. Bye. Okay, and next uh, we have Priscilla Baker with the NRCS office. I guess I could do it for you. One, uh, that blue one, yes. All right, we'll try it. We should practice this. Okay. <laughs> okay, let me go to. Let's see here. Give me a second. Okay. 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 Um, good morning, everybody. I'll just introduce myself first. I'm Priscilla Baker. I'm the Acting District Conservationist in Madeira Natural Resource Conservation Service. Um, happy to be here today. I do want to say that, you know, when I accept to talk about these things, I'm like, what am I going to do? Because I'm not an expert in water, I'm not an expert in nutrient management, but I do have a privilege to go around and visit um, many different farms in the county and see what people are doing and work with them on some exciting projects. So I think that's what I can bring to this, um, to the event today is pull in some exciting things that are happening around the Derrick County and show them to you. So I talk to some of these, to um, several growers and I always get permission before I, you know, if you're concerned about any of your contracts, talk to them and um, get permission to share any of the information and, uh, and specifically to say, you know, this is so-and-so's place. So what I want to discuss today is um, as we are facing um, this groundwater overdraft challenge, the Sigma challenge, kind of two related challenges for us in the county, what are people doing to better position themselves, better position their farm, better position the county to deal with this um, in the future? You can get the computer and it should be the top arrow. Like on the side, it's on the side. This way, yes. Your computer? Mm -hmm. It doesn't work. Oh wait, it's, no, it's not going. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, okay, so what I would like for everyone to think about, you know, you know we have a lot of CCAs, PCAs, farmers here. <coughs> Um, on your land and on the ground, the people that you work with, can you take additional surface water if your ground is, is saturated? If we have a big water here, if we have it this year or if we have it three years from now, where could you put it? Um, where does your soil infiltrate heavy rains or does it pond and evaporate or does it run off? Um, and can you use surface water instead of groundwater in certain situations? And I looked at our, so in our county and for the uh, Chowchilla Basin and for the Madeira Basin, I looked at their uh, um, GSP plans, their groundwater sustainability plans. And, you know, part of the plan of, of being in, of bringing our basin into um, sustainable use for water is um, they're both encouraging, they're both need on farm recharge to happen. For the Chowchilla plan, it's about 6,000 acre feet annually. Now, we know it won't be every year that we can charge that water because some years we're going to have drought years, we're going to have average years, and we're going to have big years. Um, it'll be maybe every three to five years. So take that 6,000 acre feet and multiply it by three or five, and that's how much water that um, the Chowchilla Basin has, um, or that uh, the GSA has calculated, you know, with all their other projects that um, they also need the growers in the basin to recharge on their land. 
in order to bring the basin and maintain its sustainability. Um, in the GSP for Madeira, um, GSA, they didn't specify a number, but I do know they're, they're encouraging in their plan to utilize their surface water supplies um, and also to, um, to use the surface water supplies for recharge when it's available. Next thing, thank you. Um, so I'm pulling some examples from some growers of things they're doing, and I want to look at a few, uh, three, basically three principles in this. And uh, first, develop a soil that can absorb and infiltrate water, be that in a basin or be that in, in the orchard or vineyard or on your cropland. Utilize surface water instead of groundwater where possible and <coughs> practical. Um, and put flood flows in dedicated or temporary areas for recharge purposes. First, pick, first note, um, you know, we'll, people will talk about this with cover crops or, you know, in time permanent cover. Um, healthy soil infiltrates water and holds it in the root zone also and prevents ponding and runoff. Okay. And um, if you have frequently bare disk soils, they don't infiltrate water. You know, a lot of a lot of the infiltration capability is based on soil type, percent clay, silt, or clay, loam, sand. But that's only part of it. And management practices are a large part of how much um, water and how fast water the soil can infiltrate. Even loamy sand will seal off and shed water instead of instead of bringing it into the profile. Next thing. Um, and we can see this in some of the orchards around our vineyards. Um, if you drive around, you can see ponding after the rain. That's one of my favorite activities of just drive around and see where's the water standing? Where is it going down? And I, you know, we can do that on um, we can do that through the county, you can do that on your on your own property. It's, where is, you know, where is that ponding and where is it infiltrating? So you can look for evidence of, um, of the ponding after when it's, after it's dried out. You can see some in, at the bottom of this field. Next thing. Um, and this is a, this is a, a grower in, um, in Madeira to put grass into their pistachios. And it, this, this orchard infiltrates water fantastically. It's a, this is an annual grass. It's um, meant to green up in the winter, die back, and, um, and they mow it, and it reseeds itself. It's a brown. Um, another, another aspect is infrastructure. Um, are you installing a drip system? Connect to surface water and well water at the same time. And this is something at the NRCS office we've been able to work on um, fund some of these projects and also work with our growers that are doing, um, you know, drip systems, applying for drip system funding. It's very, it's competitive with us and it's very popular and we, we do them every year. We do fund them every year, um, but we're looking at maximize people's ability to, um, to stay connected to their well water or, re or I'm sorry, to their surface water or reconnect to it. Maybe they've, um, uh, you know, maybe they've, um, they have an existing drip system and they want to connect it to the surface water and they might need pumps, they might need filters, um, station upgrades. Um, it just depends on the, on the system. Next thing. Uh, this is, this is one project we did last year. In this case, it was just a pump with, with that we funded, but uh, other, you know, it ended up being a few other things were needed, standpipe. Um, some, uh, fill, I think it did need a filter station upgrade in the end. And, uh, but now this grower can use, can use surface water and they're pretty excited about it for their, for both, you know, making sure they have good water quality going on their trees and then also, um, flexibility. Um, next, next part is, uh, next capacity, um, would be Agmar and Floodmar. So, man, these are these refer to managed aquifer recharge. Um, Floodmar is you're your, your moving water somewhere. It could be ag land, it could be not ag land, for the purpose of it recharging. Um, 
Agmar is going to be specifically on agricultural ground. And, and then I think recharge basins, I guess they're kind of a, more of a flood more, but reach, then we have recharge basins, which are dedicated, dedicated basins for recharge. Uh, next, Amy. Growers and um, again, all these folks said, sure, talk about our project. Um, they're using some natural features on their property uh, for water storage, for water uh, recharge, and they're also building some uh, places on their property. And this could, you know, for the natural features, you might have a pond, wetland, a slough, you might have um, tailwater sumps, and you might have existing reservoirs. Okay. Uh, first, first example I'll show, and this was um, visiting with uh, uh, Uptons, and they're in uh, south south end of Merced County, but they've got a they've got some reservoirs on the property that they're using for both moving water around and also for recharge. So this particular project was a rectangular uh, irrigation basin, and they worked with us to um, add kind of a shallow area for wildlife habitat and also increase the capacity of their, of their reservoir. Next. Um, and this is another on, on the Upton's land. They have installed a narrow recharge irrigation reservoir. This is maybe about um, two, three acres here. And um, Cole tells me it, it will hold, they can put five acre feet in it and four acre feet will infiltrate in one day. And this is, you know, a small footprint um, at the edge of the field. So I, I like the I think it's a unique design. Next thing. Another, another view on this, on this uh, irrigation slash recharge basin. Um, another, another interesting project that I, I was able to work on, this is with Pat Manning down by, down by the San Joaquin River. This is a, uh, a pond that is cut off from the San Joaquin River. It, you know, it used to be, you know, probably 80, 100 years ago, overland floods would come through. Um, the landscape looked a little different here. And also, when, on a high water year, the groundwater will come up into this pond. But what, what we worked on with them was to, you know, in a, um, you know, to give them the capacity to move water into here. So for recharge purposes. So it, what it took was um, pipe. Can you, can you get a next thing? So what this took was, um, and, and one more, just to from you. We're skipping ahead here. Way back. Thanks, Andy. <laughs> so. Okay, so this project, um, it took piping flow meter, you know, they want to be able to meter how much water they're putting into this pond, but they want the capability in a big year to be able to put water in here. And I'm going to say this is probably a um, two to three acre wetted area. Um, and, you know, what, how we did it, how we worked with them was um, fund the pipe or fund towards the pipe flow meter. Um, I don't remember if we had if the pump was involved. Um, but, and then also a, an acreage payment for three years to, to manage water on it. So, and it was for a wildlife purpose, but then after that, they've still got the infrastructure in place and they can, you know, when they want to, when they're, when they have the opportunity, they can put water here. And the idea is it's going to, it's going to recharge and, um, provide that benefit for, for their farm and then locally. Um, and let's go next one. And the last project we have, um, Smart Hudson's and, um, he is, this is, this is a plan. So we've got, it's, um, plan to be starting this fall, facilitating recharge of surface water use on the property. Um, he's going to remove this orchard here, uh, level it. Currently, flood irrigation is not feasible, and um, he wants to um, add pipe, add put cover crop on it, 
to increase infiltration, keep it open for a couple of years. And, you know, at replant, the idea is that the water will be able to circulate. So it doesn't um, just stay in one place. And so we can increase oxygen in the water, keep oxygen in the water, and be able to take, uh, take surface water for, for recharge purposes. Um, other plan is possibly less acreage planted and I have a sump area at the, low, at the lower end of the field. So this will take that, the movement. So um, this will this will be an exciting project to see how this how this plays out and um, what what happens. And next thing. Okay, so to this point, you know, our work with our work on these projects has been facilitating surface water, and that's still where we are because there are a few things that you know if you said, hey, I want to I want to come in and apply for funding to do a recharge basin on my farm. Well, we're, we're not there yet, but what NRCS is doing is piloting these projects with some, um, they're looking this year to pilot it with um, irrigation districts. Uh, we've had some discussions locally, some things are working with, I think, um, some districts further south also. So we want to we use it with the irrigation districts first, and then before it's, you know, to uh, the growers that we're working with. Um, Let's see, but at, to this point, we are facilitating use of surface water. So if we can help folks move it, um, utilize it, and then if you use that to recharge, wonderful. And um, that, is, that is all I have. So I'll take any questions, comments. Caution, Priscilla, if, if uh... You know, we, we talked to Mama Scratch. One of the concerns, you know, I think, you know, the we've seen recharge on uh, the work really well at Don Cameron's. You know, he's kind of the poster child. Mm -hmm. You know, Mark's going to be our guy. But um, I think guys that are growing um, any type of uh, tree or anything, what, what is concerning is when we do recharge, you know, there's, you know, spring winds, you know, trees goes in full canopy and then you know, and the problem is is it you know works well you know if you go ahead and recharge early um but you're always concerned about the rain right when we get a big spring you know canopy sets you know and then all of a sudden you get these winds so i think there's a little bit of resistance you know there may be some pipe top or you know different things that, that are being created in just depend on your soil type. But I think those are things. Is there a program specific, like if in Norma's situation where she wanted to take five acres out and have a specific basin? You know, I know Mark's talked about, and maybe you can talk a little bit about that, how you're planning to do that. So I think that's going to be critical for people to start stacking water and water flows. At my home, uh, yeah, we're right behind the So there is no recharge in that quantity basin, right? So can you talk maybe a little bit? And I think Mark went through this: the efficiency and how you, you know, how you, you target those basins so that we know exactly if we're getting it into the ground. Sure. Um, thanks, Matt. And I, you know, I think that's why we are, you know, on the NRCS level, they're looking to do the pilot programs with the districts first to see have they done some subsurface research. Is this going to go down? Is there, you know, we have a hard, we have hard pan here. Um, so I, you know, I think they really want to say how, what does it take to make it successful without over, you know, making it too much of a geotechnical exploration, you know, for the average grower. We, you know, but it, we do want it to work. We want to have some projects that right off the bat we're seeing, we're seeing positive effects. And while also 
they're looking at things like, okay, you got to have, you know, are you impacting negatively downstream? What about nutrients? What about um, seeping up on a neighbor's property? So these are all kind of site specific issues that um, we just, uh, I think, you know, it's, it's got to be looked at case by case. And, um, you, you know, and sometimes and you can't really judge by necessarily when you, when you want to put in a big, a lot of water to go down a place. If, it, if the surface is loamy sand, it may, it might not be that, it, you know, 10, 20 feet down. Um, so I think it is a site specific issue and that's why we are, you know, NRCS has been taking it a little slow on that and trying to do some pilot projects with the with districts first before um, we start, you know, putting it with individual growers. But, you know, right now that's, that's, that's kind of why I like the idea of, um, what's already on somebody's property that they can utilize that we don't have to, you know, saturate the orchard. We don't have to um, uh, build, you know, build something really big right now. Like what have you already got out there that you could, you could put water and that people have experience and they know, they know water goes down over here, but we do have to look at those, at those issues that, you know, we don't want to nitrate load. Um, create a problem in, in, while we're fixing another issue. And do you have questions? Yeah, I have a question for on Mark's piece. Is that like a 40 acre piece, or what size of piece is that? 40. Mark. 40. It's a 40, and then was that a recharge basin on top? That red, that red, red <laughs> piece? That was a pipe. That was a pipe. It that was, was a just pipe. A, yeah, that's a pipe. And so what? What is the delivery method of the recharge? The water is, it comes in from CWD. CWD, right? I think it's delivered. On the field, how? Just through. Uh, well, there would be a pipe put into flood irrigation, which isn't there now. Oh, got it. So it needs to be. The idea is, you know, no matter what the problems are that we look at as far as trees falling over or, or <coughs> we don't have enough water. Right. So if everybody does something, that adds up to a lot, whether it's five acres, 40 acres, whatever. This piece. You know, Chachilla Waters had cheap, cheap, free, basically free water during 1970, right? But nobody took it because they don't want to put it, right? So by having a return system put in, and this will be a real shallow return system. I mean, I, I plan to be able to drive a tractor through it, right? And leaving the corner and having to deep pump it out. But set what we're doing is when we take out an orchard, we plant an orchard, we don't prep the recharge. So all it is is saying, look, when we take out our orchards, let's prep for recharge or on farm recharge. Right? And so when those years are there, we can take that surface water that Madeira IV has or Chachello water district has and put it on the ground and cycle around so our trees don't you know, lose oxygen. And we'll learn. Yeah. You know, and maybe, you know, I'm kind of getting lazy. I'd like to leave it empty. And not have the farmer go on vacation, but there's no set uh, ability to receive money from the district or the white area yet for taking that out of production. But hey, I'd be happy with some money to, to uh, yeah, well, work I mean, so hard. What I like about it is it seems like these recharge projects that we're seeing or have been seeing, I have been seeing these large massive projects for like farmer who farms one just a hundred acres of how we can do that. That's good. How we didn't do that. But a 40 acre piece is uh, you know real projects add up to a lot. Yeah, Ten acres, acres, five acres, four acres. We're not all done camera and we'll do this. Well he's got he's got the river next to him. Right. <laughs> but you know one thing the dams did is they helped a lot. But one thing they did is they prevented the 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 uh, floodplains, the recharge of the floodplains. So all this is doing is taking the irrigation districts and using them to recreate the floodplains on a few acres of all of our farm. Right? So it's everybody doing a little bit that adds up to a whole heck of a lot. And uh, so I've seen it happen and I've passed it by past life. And really the water only has to be about four inches deep, if that. It's just a sheen over the wall over the ground. And it goes in. You just, you put in, it doesn't have to be a big reservoir, you don't have to worry about four foot dikes, you just put up a hay berm and let it run, and then you recycle it out. It's, you've done it before, but we're growing something. Right. But here, you can do for the grant, you have to be able to plant cover crops and hedgerows, but you know, stuff like that, which is no big deal. 
uh, helps with the monarch, helps with you know, organic matter. I mean, my soil doesn't have any organic matter. But when I recycle those trees, it's going to go into the soil. I'm going to wait one, two, well, probably three to five years to replant it. I'm not going to have to fumigate. I'm going to have all that phosphorus, potassium, uh, microorganisms in there, and we'll see what happens. Um, I'm old, I can use a good drink. Take notes and share those notes with people. I think we labor from you. Are there any other questions? Quick question. You mentioned uh, funding for surface water use. How do we go about doing that? I think it's it's got to be like a, first of all, it's already irrigated ground. And it's site specific, I'll say. Like, let's talk about it. Like, I, and what I'm trying to, I'm hoping that the AFT, Funding that's coming through that they're going to focus on that is I don't know how it's going to it's come together, um, but and I'll say it hasn't been a slam dunk at this point to get these funded. Um, lately, we've got we've had a lot of applications for everything, um, but um, you know the funding is not a guarantee. Just there's a lot of competition. But I basically I've been working with guys and saying and we've gotten some of them funded. So let, we can just we can talk about it. Okay, thank you for showing you. And then uh, Dr. Bobby will be presenting next. So, I think the recharge conversation it needs to keep happening after this next speaker when we have time because there's some different things we need to talk about as well. So, it's super important when things are about to stop. <laughs> Good morning. I'm a uh, water irrigation specialist based at the Kermiak Center. It's about just 45 minutes uh, from here at, uh, uh, in the Fresno County. Let's see if it doesn't work. So it doesn't work. Let me see. I can try it. Let's Yeah. Yeah. All right. okay. So we go next. All right. So we heard a lot about groundwater recharge, and that's really a very interesting topic. You know, as you know, we're dealing with the drought, and there are so many different things that we can do to address limited water supplies. One of them is to improve irrigation efficiency. So if you have an existing irrigation system, whether it's flood, drip irrigation, or sprinkler irrigation. You know, if you improve the efficiency, you could be saving water and energy. We can look at uh, deficit irrigation on certain crops, and we've done a lot of work on deficit irrigation on alfalfa, especially in the summertime. If you don't have enough water, you know, you could uh, uh, skip a few irrigations in summertime. You can look at uh, new cropping systems that use less water, for example, sunflower, olives, and, and, and so on. Other practices taking land out of production, this is very common down in uh, Southern California, where, you know, Imperial Valley uh, and Palo Verde area. Or we can look at irrigation management, you know, how we can improve our, uh, the way we manage the irrigation so we can end up with uh, improving water savings. Uh, next slide, please. Okay. So what do we mean by irrigation management? Uh, three different components, applying the right amount of water to meet the crop water requirements. It's like, you know, how many inches I need to apply in any given irrigation? And that depends on the irrigation system that we have. How often do we need to irrigate? Do I need to irrigate once a week? Uh, if I have drip irrigation twice a week, or three times a week, or six times a week? And that depends on the crop, the irrigation system, and the soil type that I have. And we heard a lot about the distribution uniformity, making sure that our irrigation system is very efficient. So I could get brand new drip irrigation system with efficiency of, how much do you think the efficiency of the brand new irrigation system? 90 plus. 90, okay, 90, 90%, 95%. Okay, a year from now or two years from now, do you think that efficiency would be the same? Most likely it will go down and you want to do at least 
uh, distribution uniformity testing maybe once a year to, to, to make sure that things are going fine. Next slide, please. Okay, so irrigation scheduling. Uh, there are several ways where you can look at irrigation scheduling. Um, let me give you an idea. A very simple question. How long does it take to drive from here to San Francisco? <laughs> Just an estimate. Two hours and 20 minutes. Two hours and 20 minutes. Any other answer? Three hours. Like three hours? Three okay. <laughs> All right. So if you have the traffic, three hours. All right. So the two and a half or three hours, that's a really good start because you're making this based on very simple fact. You know that the distance from here to San Francisco is about what, 140, 150 miles. On average, I'm going to go anywhere from 50 to 60 to 70, depending on the traffic. So we can go with that simple approach and do irrigation management based on that simple fact, knowing just basically what's the weather conditions that we have here. And from that, we can make an, a good estimate. Now we can go to the next step, all right? So the first one is looking at ET, reference about transpiration. I'm sure all of you have the SEMIS, the California Irrigation Management Information System. So my SEMIS would be the two and a half, three hours, okay? So if I can look at SEMIS, I can just get the number right away from, you know, from the radio or from, uh, from the newspaper or from the internet. I can find out what's the average evapotranspiration right now. And I can start with this. And this is a good estimate to start with. Now I can go to the next step, soil moisture. And soil moisture will give me, you know, more flexibility in deciding, well, it's going to take me three hours or three and a half hours because of the traffic. Now the soil moisture is the same thing. It's just going to give me one more uh, piece of information that will help me out making the right decision. Then I want to go to the extra step. Uh, extra step. I can look at the plant and ask the plant: Is it stressed or not? And there are so many different ways. You know, you're all familiar with stem water retention. I can use infrared thermometer and measure the temperature of the plant. How many of you have grapes? Do, you, do, you, do we have grape growers? Okay. So what what's a simple way to see if the grape is stressed? Tenderal. Leave. Okay, great. I can touch the grape leaf and get an idea, you know, with the experience, we can say, okay, well, you know, plant is stressed, or I can use infrared uh, thermometer and compare it to the air temperature. If the plant temperature is lower than the air temperature, that's a good indication that the plant is not stressed. If the temperature is higher, that's a good indication that uh, the plant is stressed. And the best thing to do is a combination of the above three. So you can get, you know, uh, the, uh, the accurate information. Right now, especially over the last 10, 15 years, we have plenty of technology available to help us fine tuning, you know, the, the two and a half or three hour uh, time that will take us to San Francisco. Next, please. So we'll be talking about these technologies. Now, in general, you know, a lot of us, we used, were used to flood irrigation systems. If you go back to the 90s and the 80s, we used to have, you know, a lot of flood irrigation systems. We still have them on field crops. But as we know, as we go to uh, tree crops, we're switching more into drip irrigation. So in general, when you're looking at the different irrigation systems, with the flood irrigation, we're applying a lot of water could be anywhere from three to four. If we have light sandy soil, we may apply eight, nine, 10 inches. If we have sprinkler irrigation system, we're applying less, okay? Maybe an inch, an inch and a half. If we have drip irrigation, we're applying even less. And typically, I would say anywhere from half an inch to an inch per irrigation event. Next slide, please. All right, so when you look at soil moisture, there are so many different defi definitions, you know, like MAD, management allowable depletion, soil water holding capacity, threshold. I wouldn't worry about, you know, understanding all these terms. Like let's say, if I take a foot of the soil from my field, imagine, you know, you're taking a foot of that soil from your field, 
the soil is completely saturated after a flood irrigation event. Now, and I extract all the moisture out of it. How many inches do you think I can get out of that foot? In general, about maybe six inches, right? So if I can extract all that moisture by heat, like, you know, in the northern, I will get six inches. Out of that six inches, that is not available to the plant. Maybe about half of it is available. So out of those six inches, I have three inches available. And now it depends on what soil type I have and what crop I have. So out of these three inches, if I have, if I'm growing vegetables or strawberry, maybe I only have one inch. I'm growing alfalfa, maybe I have two inches or three inches. So keeping this in mind, and that's basically what we look at when we look at soil moisture. So a reading that I have on the grapes, it's going to be completely different than the reading that I have on alfalfa, depending on the crop and depending on the soil type. Next slide, please. Okay, so the best thing to do is get to know your soil. And there are so many, uh, you know, in the old times we used to have those maps, NRCS maps, we can go take a look. And the map will tell me, okay, I have, you know, soil type 114 here, for example, low. And from there, I can take a look at that soil type and get more information about it. What's the water holding capacity? You know, what's, uh, you know, if I have this soil type, how many inches are available for my crop? So most likely, you know, one inch is available from every foot of soil. So if I have a vegetable crop and I'm going only 18 inches, you know, I want to do the irrigation whenever I have a depletion of about an inch and a half or two. If I have uh, alfalfa, you know, my root zone would be four feet. If I have almond, my root zone could be four feet. If I have flood irrigation, could be the effective root zone could be two feet if I have drip irrigation. And again, depends on the soil type. So the first step is to go and take a look and understand what soil type you have. Next uh, slide, please. Okay, so when it comes to soil type, Typically, we look at sand, silt, clay. We look at the percentage of these three different soil particles and come up with a soil texture. Okay, and there are so many soil texture, you know, types. But I like it to keep it simple. And you can uh, look at soils on the heavy side, like clay soils, loamy soils, and on the light side, like sandy soils, and something in between, you know. So on the heavy side, we have, you know, soils like with high water holding capacity, and we heard a lot about groundwater recharge. So those soils, they have high water holding capacity, they hold a lot of moisture, but when it comes to infiltration rate, how fast the water moves through the ground, that those are relatively low, and those are not great for groundwater recharge. Now, if you look at the medium type, you know, loamy, silty loam, those are the great soil where we have medium water holding capacity, they hold enough moisture for the crop. And also they have good infiltration rate, not great, but good infiltration rate that allow me to do groundwater research. And then we have, you know, the lighter side where we have low water holding capacity. You know, if I have a foot of sand and it's saturated, I can extract six inches, but if I have it, uh, if I have a mesh underneath with the gravity, most of that moisture will go down. So my water holding capacity is very little for the plant, but my infiltration rate would be great for groundwater research. So keep this in mind and get to know your soil. Next slide, please. There are plenty of resources. The one that I like most is uh, uh, the uh, web soil survey from USDA. You can click, uh, uh, I mean, you can Google web soil survey and it's relatively easy. Within a few minutes, you'll get a map. Next slide, please. All right, so we talked about soil moisture and soil moisture you know, these are example of, uh, you know, uh, soil moisture sensors. There are so many on the market. It's like, you know, if you want to buy a car, we have so many options. 
Same thing for solar options. There are so many options on the market and we can, you know, if you have questions, we can help you with that. But in general, you know, we're looking at the soil profile. Okay, what is my root zone? If my root zone is four feet, most of the uptake is from the top two feet. So typically we say 40% of the uptake from the first foot, 30% from the second foot. But when I look at soil moisture, I want to look at the entire soil profile. Well, one good reason for that is I want to look at the four foot depth and what's going on there. If the soil is wet all the time, it means I'm over irrigating, okay? So this is a good indication for, you know, over irrigation. If the soil is relatively, you know, medium moisture, that I'm doing a, a good job. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so uh, how do we irrigate? We need to know what's the crop water uh, use. Crop water use is typically estimated from the reference in evapotranspiration, which is like a grass and stress grass, like you know, in your front yard, backyard. How much that grass is used is basically what we call reference in evapotranspiration. And from there, like if my grass, you know, summertime is using quarter of an inch a day, that's you know, that's unstressed grass. I can relate this one to my crop. So if I have almond and we're in March or April, my almond crop may be using about 30 or 40 percent of what the grass is using. In summertime, that almond crop may be using a hundred. 100% or maybe 110 or 120% of what the grass is, is doing. So I can relate everything to the reference value transpiration by what we call a crop coefficient. Next slide, please. You say you can. Can. Yeah, we can. We can. Yeah, so what, what we call it is a crop coefficient. So I can use the reference value transpiration as my, you know, two and a half, three hour. Uh, distance, I mean, time to San Francisco, and then I do a fraction. Like, you know, if I want to go uh, to, uh, you know, to a city halfway between uh, here and San Francisco, it would be a fraction of the distance to San Francisco. So how do we measure the crop coefficient? Basically, we take the reference evaporation, transpiration, which is available from DWR, and uh, multiply it by the crop coefficient, we get our crop water use. The next slide, please. SEMIS uh, has uh, so many stations over the state, there are over 150. In the old days, they used to have this map, and this is a good start. You know, the map has 18 different zones, and I can just look at my city here. Okay, it looks like Madeira, we're in uh, zone 12. Next slide, please. Okay, and I can look at zone 12 and it will, it will give me, you know, what's the average uh, ET on a monthly basis. I can just divide it by 30. In this example, in May, uh, ETO is about seven inches divided by 30. I get about two tenths of an inch a day. So this is a good, start ETO in Madeira in May is about two tenths of an inch. Good enough, right? Okay, next slide. Now this is in the old days now. We have a lot more technology. We use satellite. I don't have to worry about which station I'm gonna go and can go to a map and click on my feet. Next slide, please. Okay. And I can click on my location and get the reference to that transpiration of yesterday. And that is really good. It's, it's uh, free and available to everybody. This is just an example. I want to show you how much variation we have, even though we said in May, our average about transpiration is about two tenths of an inch. This is from two years ago. You can see from one day to another. This is relatively cool day. The next day, it's warmer, and the third day is even warmer than the second one. Next slide, please. Uh, you can get this service from Senes. You can just click on your location, uh, just give, give them your email, and they can send you an email every Monday. 
And every Monday, I will give you the actual power transformation at your farm uh, for the previous week. Next, next slide, please. All right. So this is an example where you could see the variation, the traffic between here and San Francisco. Sometimes it's bad, sometimes it's not. You can see within one week, we said in May, our ETO here is about two tenths of an inch. You could see in some days we got one tenth of an inch, and in other days we got 0.25 inches. So you could see about you know 50 50 percent variability within even one week. And this is very important, especially if you have drip irrigation. If you have flood irrigation, you have plenty of you know room to to to, to adjust. But if you have drip irrigation, you know, the system is designed for a maximum uh, application for like 18 hours or 20 hours. And if you go get behind, even if you run the system all the time, you're not going to be able to catch up. Next slide, please. So the crop coefficient accounts for the variability that we have uh, in our crop. You know, it depends on the crop itself. It depends on management practices. One of them is the irrigation system. Uh, and a good example here, if you have micro sprinklers and you're irrigating every day, you know, the ground is wet. The crop may not be using very much water, but you have lots of evaporation going on. And the crop coefficient will take care of that. Next slide, please. Okay, and this is how we come up with the crop coefficient. We find a way where we can measure the actual water use of the crop with some of the scientific methods that I will discuss later and divided by the reference about transpiration that we get from cells. Next slide, please. Next, please. Okay, so the crop coefficient looks something like this. So for almond, it may start about 30% in March, may go to about 110 in June, July, and toward the end of the season around this time, it's gonna go down. Next slide, please. And this is example of how we determine crop coefficient, and I use in this example sunflower. So you see the red line is the reference about transpiration, the blue line is the actual crop water use. Next slide, please. Mm -hmm. If I can, uh, you know, with this information, I can determine the crop coefficient. You see, you know, variability, but the crop coefficient looks like this for sunflower. So we have crop coefficients for a lot of the major crops that we have in California. Next slide, please. And uh, these are some of the scientific methods that we use to determine the actual crop water use. And right now we have lots of stations uh, all over the state on a whole bunch of crops working with the commercial companies. Next slide. Now let's talk about the new technologies. How many of you have heard of Thule, Thule Technologies? All right, so Thule Technologies is one of these, uh, you know, sophisticated surface uh, renewals, a method called surface renewal was developed by, this company started by one of the graduate students from the Tom Chapman. You know, he got his degree from Davis about 10 years ago and then He's so all like, you know, you need a station, we need to spend about ten fifteen thousand dollars to get the surface renewal system. And in order to get the data and analyze it and everything, you need to have, you know, a degree and know how to download data, how to process data, how to do quality assurance. So he came up with a company and basically looking at the temperature sensor that measuring air temperature so many times a second. And from there, you can determine actual crop uh, coefficient. So this is a Thule system. This is been it's been on the market for about six seven years. So this is on alpha alpha. You could use it. You can determine the actual crop water use. Forget about semis. Forget about crop coefficient. Now you're talking to the plant directly, and plant telling you, okay, I used this much yesterday. Uh, there are. Other technologies, you know, we can look at infrared temperature, temperature, and that will give, in, give us an indication whether the plant is stressed or not. Next slide, please. Uh, so this is infrared, you know, on a small scale right here. 
Over there, this is another technology where you have a tower. You could scan about you know, a mile around your field and determine you know, the infrared tem uh, temperature. And that will give you an idea about where you have stress and if you need to irrigate or not. Next slide, please. Uh, there is another technology called Arabel Mark, and basically it's a sensor that measures up, takes a whole bunch of measurements, about 40 of them. And one of these measurements would be the, the crop coefficient, the temperature of the air, temperature of the crop, solar radiation, and a whole bunch of them. So this technology is available right now, and this is also a good tool to, to tell you how the plant is doing. Next slide, please. Okay. And we've done some work on evaluating some of these technologies. So at Davis, we looked at the Thule and the most sophisticated method for measuring crop water use right now, which is the eco-variance method, where you have you have to spend about $15,000 and, and have somebody uh, taking data all the time. And actually, that method is relatively good. I mean, within 5% of the the state of the art scientific method. So this is an indication that you know you're, you can get somewhere with these new technologies. Next slide, please. Okay, so how do I determine you know my crop water use? I can use the reference about transpiration, I can use the crop coefficient and determine last week, and from there based on my current irrigation system application rate, I can determine how many hours I'm gonna irrigate. I'm not gonna go through the calculations. This presentation will be available uh, to you, you know, later on. Next slide, please. And, you know, keep in mind, we always have to consider the irrigation efficiency. So in this case, as my application efficiency is 80%, I need to add, add additional water to make sure that I'm irrigating the entire, you know, field uniformly, and and, and this is why it's important to do, to do DU testing because if the DU is relatively low, you're going to end up applying more water, more energy, and more money. All right. Next slide, please. And you know, from there you can based on the application rate that you get from Dominic later on. You can determine how many hours that you need to irrigate. And that's example, you know, 3.8 hours or four hours. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so this is a good example of other technologies based on remote sensing. Uh, series images available where you can get an idea about where you have stress. You can look at the numbers, I mean, the colors here. Red is a stress. Yellow is moderate stress, green and blue are, you know, you're in great shape. Okay, this is a commercial almond field, about 70 acres. And you can look on April 10th, you look at the map, you see lots of red, right? Lots of red, lots of uh, yellow, and a little bit of a green and blue. Now, on early May, May 2nd, you could see that the field is doing really good, you know, we don't have stress. May 14th, the same thing, the field is doing great. We can also, stress could be related to, most of the time it's related to moisture, but if we have salinity, we need to consider salinity. So this is an example where we can scan, where we scan for salinity. Next slide, please. Okay. Uh, you remember the crop coefficients and you know the ETO and all that stuff. If you want to skip it, you can go to the Fresno Cooperative Extension Office, sign up for this newsletter, and make a number. The not crop advisor will send you an email on Friday, and that email will contain something like this, which it tells you, okay, for this specific crop. You lost the bad one point two inches last And from there, how much you need to irrigate. Even, you know, you can look at how many gallons you lost per each tree. And from there, you can determine, you know, how, 
How many hours we need to run the system? Next slide, please. And, and here, you know, I'm just giving you an example. So from that report that you get from the Fresno office, uh, uh, from the Fresno office, the ETC for your crop, uh, you know, last week was 1.06. Okay. Application efficiency or distribution uniformity is 85%. So my irrigation requirement will be 1.06 divided by 85%, and that's an inch and a quarter of an inch. Okay, go ahead, sir. Uh, do you use 85% and uh, uh, if you're drip irrigating, which is say 90%, mm -hmm. do you factor that efficiency in your calculation? Well, you yes, yeah. 1.25 yes. divided by 0.9. No, no, you factor it. You have the 1.06, that's the actual crop water use. If your DU is 90%, yeah. you take the 1.06 divided by 90%, and you're going to end up with a number less than 1.25. Yeah. And this is really important why you need to do DU. If your DU is 50%, and your ETC is 1, one divided by 50, you need to apply two inches. That's money lost to energy. All right, so this is why it's so we, important. We have DU and we have the efficiency of the irrigation system. They are the same. They're the same. Yeah, they're the same. Okay, so you don't have to continue, you don't have to divide the efficiency of your system. That's incorporated in DU. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So in, in general, for drip irrigation, it's the DU. For other irrigation system, it's application efficiency. So I use the big term application efficiency as a shift of system. But for drip irrigation system, you need to worry only about the So just divide by the Okay, I have to look at rainfall. Did I get rainfall over the last seven days? If the answer is no, then it's zero. If I got half an inch last week and I need to apply 1.25 inch, well, that half an inch most likely is beneficial use, and I will subtract it from the 1.25. Okay, if I got an inch and a half, I don't need to irrigate because my crop lost only 1.25 inches, including efficiency. From there, I can determine, you know, how many hours I need to irrigate. Uh, 1.25 inches per week, and when I have the drip irrigation system. They tell me what's my application uh, rate. So in this case, the application rate is about one tenth of an inch per hour. All right. When you do the DU testing, they give you this number. Okay. Your flow meter also can give you this number by you know just doing very simple calculation. So in this case, you know I need to irrigate for 14 hours. Okay. I need to irrigate for 14 hours based on my, you know based on the ET of last week, I could, how do I, uh, you know, I could run the system for one day, 14 hours a day, I mean, 14 hours one time a week, or I could split into different irrigations. I could do, if I do like, you know, two irrigations a week, I'll do seven hours and seven hours. If I have a standard soil, I want to have more frequent Next slide, please. May I, may I ask a question? Sure, sir. So, and I may have missed it, but so uh, precipitation is accounted for here. Is uh, temperature accounted for? So, no. the heat of the summer? ETO will capture all the weather factors temperature, solar radiation, uh, cloud coverage, you know, yeah. wind, the humidity. Everything is lump sum in ETO. It's ETO is basically how much energy that you have available to evaporate and transfer it. Okay. Yeah, so you don't need to worry about temperature. Well, there is another way to look, you know, from, uh, from the publications from, uh, you know, the extension office. It may tell me, okay, you need to do 296 gallons per tree. I can just multiply how many trees I have per acre times the number of acres, and that will give me how many gallons. This is also another symbol. So 650 gallons. 
650,000 gallons. I need to know what's my application, what's my flow meter. Okay. Flow meter reading is really important. It's like, you know, that uh, it's like a watch, you know, the time right now is 10, 10, 30. My watch will tell me the exact amount. So it's important to have this flow meter. The flow meter design, like here, you know, it's 800 gallons per minute. I can just divide the 650,000 by 800 and it will give me, you know, 13. 6 hours to edit. All right. Another important thing for having a flow meter, if my design shows that my flow meter should be running at 800 gallons per minute, what do you think if I go take a look at the flow meter and the flow meter is reading 900, 950, what's going on? Well, my design from Dominic is 800 and now, but my flow meter is showing 950. It means I have a leak somewhere, right? So this is a good indication that I need to go and walk the, the field and see where I have the leak, all right? So if my design uh, rate is 800 gallons per minute and I look at my flow meter and it's showing 600, well, it's the other way around. It means like I have emitters that they are plugged and I may need to replace them or clean them. So this is a good uh, this is a good reason to have um, the function flow function of pressure though. Pressure changes. It doesn't that's, change. That's that's and a then good you don't yeah. have a leak and you don't have plug emitters. That's, that's a great you may that's that's uh, that's another scenario where you don't have enough pressure and this is the flow meter is, is going down. So there are you know, different ways, uh, different reasons for the flow meter to, to go down. Yeah. Uh, great uh, comment. The next slide, please. Okay, you remember all these calculations with the Thule system. Forget about the calculations. I can just look at my Thule system. This is the Thule system on Almond and Hanford. It tells me what's my salt water holding capacity. I can just put the emitter spacing, the flow rate per emitter, and everything. Next slide, please. And, uh, and they will tell you, okay, your application rate is about one tenth of an inch per hour. Next slide, please. And uh, uh, they can give me the last week on a daily basis. Next slide, please. And you know they tell me, okay, well, based on what happened last week, you need to irrigate for ten and a half hours. So forget about everything else. I can use this information. They do send you a weekly email on Monday with this information. You don't even have to log in. If you want to get more involved, you know, you can log in and take a look at the crop coefficient and and you know the the other uh, information that they have. You know, they also tell you similar fields, your neighbors, what they're doing, you know, they're irrigating about 20 hours. All right, next slide, please. Okay, this is just um, an idea about, if you see this green bar right here, this is really good. This is for the same almond field that I showed you earlier. You can see if we're in this green, zone, we're doing great. If my numbers are below, means the crop is stressed. If my numbers are higher, it means I'm applying more water. So this is good indication. They're giving me a window of, you know, what I should have. Keep in mind, you look at, this is early apron, and, you know, you could see stress right here. Okay, so from Thule, I get stress. Next slide, please. From series images, I get the same thing. It's showing me that stress, I have stress in apron and then I can catch up and add more water. And you can see I went to the green and blue zones. Next slide, please. All right, so this is my alarm that I have only five minutes left. <laughs> so we have the stem water potential. It's a great tool. There's no question this is Wonderful tool to give you an idea about stress in your field. Now, 
in order to do this, we have to go to the field. You have to be within like, you know, two, three hours of solar noon. You have, you know, you have to have the instruments. So this is a great tool, but it takes time. If you have other tools that gives you the same information, that would be great. Next slide, please. Okay, there are other uh, technologies on the market. There are dentrometers that they can tell you the shrinkage, the swelling in the tree, and indication of stress. I don't tell you how much water you need to apply, but they can give you an idea about stress. And if you need information about this, Columber, May Columber would be the best person. Uh, she has a lot of experience in, uh, in this area. You know, the soil moisture, that's also another tool that you uh, could have. Now with the sweet funding, all of these technologies we can get money for, and you can include them in your sweet application. Next slide, please. Okay, just to summarize, you know, if you're not doing anything right now, start with SEMIS, and that's the best thing, because SEMIS will give you an idea about what's going on, and then you can go to the next tools like soil moisture. If you can afford some of these technologies, that will make a big difference. We did not talk about salinity. If salinity is an issue, we have to consider it in irrigation management. So we have to do leaching. How often we have to do leaching, depending on the crop and the soil type we have and the irrigation system. And keep in mind, you're not only saving water, you're saving energy. And with the incentives for reduction in greenhouse gas emission, that's going to make a difference. And I think these programs will continue in the future for uh, California. There are so many tools avail available right now to help you make the right decisions when it comes to irrigation schedule. Next slide, please. And that conclude, concludes my talk. Questions? Right. I'm going to sound really dumb. Um, but if my pump is pumping 400 gallons a minute on the field, um, and I want to just do a quick calculation of you know, how much I'm going to get for 24 hour runs, mm -hmm. I really wouldn't need to be used back like that because I'm just, well, if my meter's not great, I guess. Yeah. It's just calculating that way. So, um, how important is it to you when you're just, you know, what your pumps are pumping? And that's what's going on in the field, other than you want to make sure it's just operating correctly. What, what, you're, what you're doing, okay, so let's say 400 gallons per minute, you multiply it by 60 by 24, that will give you, you know, how many gallons in 24 hours? You divide it by 326,000, you'll get how many inches, right? That's right. the average, okay? So that's the average application, all right? So if I have a thousand dollars and I have 50 growers here, you know, and I give them thousand dollars, on average, I give each grower twenty dollars, right? You know, a thousand divided by 50 is what, 20, right? Okay. So on average, you know, twenty dollars, each grower got twenty dollars, but you don't know. I gave, you know, this gentleman a hundred, I gave you five, I gave the next one 55. You don't know what's the distribution in the form. You know on average what you're doing, but you have no idea about how efficient is your irrigation system. And this is why it's important to know what's going on in the field by having the EU test. But it's, it's only one test a year. It's not like it has to be that part of calculation every time. It's just one time. Well, in general, I, in general, there are experts who are doing DU, but I would say, you know, for, for, for myself, I would do DU testing at least once a year. So I can identify if I have uniformity, if everybody is getting $20, that's the only way you will figure out if everybody is getting $20. When you do the DU for your farm, you'll find, you know, this tree is getting, you know, 21, the other tree is getting 18, 19, if you have 85, 90%, you're doing great. If you have 50%, you're not doing it. The, the different system that you, you had here, from seamless to expensive one, yeah. have you ever compared them for accuracy and cost? You have to actually, I guess, the cost of the system. Um, because every time you buy a new system, 
they last for a few years and then some are just one wrong. Yeah. So the simpler one seemed to be the longer lasting ones like Siemens. And then have you ever compared those that way? Well, yeah, I mean, Semis is free, so you could utilize it. <laughs> Tooly technology is about $1,650 uh, a year. It's a lease. And for sure, it's going to be accurate because they take, care, they take care of all the main things. If you buy a soil moisture sensor, you know, it may be accurate the first year. If you don't do your own maintenance on it, it will be no good, maybe. After two or three years, so it depends on the, the technology that you're using. But if you get the technology where you have a service fee and they take care of the maintenance, I would I would go for that. Until the company sells. <laughs> no, I mean you know you, you want to deal with uh, like you know I have from my own experience you know. Uh, I you know I've dealt with Thule. I have like maybe 20, 25 Thule systems all over the state and they're really good. Uh, Arabil Mark, I have a whole bunch of them. Soul Moisture, I tried so many of them and there are the advantages and disadvantages of each one. And you know, if you're interested, we can talk privately about what you have and you know, uh, my recommendations. So I'd be more than happy to discuss that with you. Go ahead, sir. I've worked with Tool too, and I think they're a good, a good platform, you know, for your dating because it gives you actual ETs in an area. But the only limitation is it, it covers, you know, you know, a set amount of property, whether it's 40 acres or if you want to extend up 80 acres. And my challenge with using it was back in the day, I, I farmed a wine company and there's a lot more acres to cover. And so I just, I, you know, my preferred method was like, I think, you know, the Seamus method with an Excel spreadsheet and the crop coefficient because that can cover all your property. Yes. For free, yeah. Which is nice. But. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, keep in mind, uh, uh, Open ET is coming up later on this year. It's going to be free. For, so you can go click on a map and look at actual ET. It's still in the development stage. Uh, there are satellites we were discussing earlier. There are methods where you can determine soil moisture from satellite images. Are they practical to use right now? No, but definitely in the future, you know, after refining and everything would be great. We're working with a company, Land IQ in Sacramento. Uh, they have a lot of weather stations actually working with us and they're coming up with ET, actual ET for crops, for not for irrigation scheduling, but for making management on a larger scale. But one thing to keep in mind, the minute you know your field, from your experience, if I can look at uh, some information from like Land IQ, and I know for my almond block of 40 acres last year, ETC was 45 inches, I can use this one for you know, making irrigation decisions for next year. There's another thing that is available right now, forecast ET. And actually, if you're interested, we're doing a lot of work on forecast ET, where I can determine, you know, what's the ET for the next seven days and making irrigation decisions. And actually, that's what we did on one of these, uh, uh, these fields. So lots of new technologies available. And is there a simpler way of, of, of uh, are crop coefficients available to us as growers uh, that make a lot of sense? Or is there, and I, I have a ranch, you know, I want to go with ET, but the crop coefficients on this. Is there a simple way that a farmer can measure that if you, without using technology? No, there's not, uh, there's not a simple way. You can get average crop coefficient for the crop, but there, you, you have to fine tune them for your needs. And I don't want to spend too much time, but I can, you know, you could start with the average crop coefficient and look at soil moisture. If the moisture is indicating that it's too wet, right. means you're applying it a little bit more. You can tweak it for next week and see how it's average ones. So you can develop your own coefficients based on that. Yeah. Okay. All right, thank you. All right, thank you, everybody. We, we will have a 15 minute break, so we will begin back at. Uh, 10.35. <laughs> 
Okay. All right. Rachel, if you want to go ahead and start your presentation, we'll let you take over. All righty. Um, hi, folks. Uh, my name is Rex Dufour. Um, I work for the National Center for Appropriate Technology. I have a few slides about that later on. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to talk to you today. Thank you, AFT and uh, East Stanislaus RCD uh, for the opportunity. Today, I'm going to be talking about soils and uh, soil management, basically about investing in your soils as you would invest in say new farm equipment or maintaining buildings or training up your farm staff. And then in the second part of the presentation, I'll be talking about nitrogen management. Um, and I'm gonna be turning off, I just wanted to give you a visual there. I'm gonna be turning off my video because uh, I think the PowerPoint works better with uh, fewer videos, so. So, I work for a nonprofit, National Center for Appropriate Technology. Uh, we have offices scattered around the country. Um, I work up in Davis. I live in Woodland, this farm town. I'm married into a farm family. Uh, they farm a uh, bunch of organic acres and some conventional acres too. And um, I'm former uh, PCA, as well as uh, I'm registered as a technical service provider with NRCS in California, Nevada. Um, so, um, NCAT manages the ATRA website and the ATRA project. ATRA is a National Sustainable Ag Information Service. Uh, just wanted to give a little plug here to what we do. You can talk to a live person with any question uh, related to organic or sustainable production of, or marketing of crops and livestock. It's free service. Uh, we have a couple toll-free lines, one in English, one in Spanish. Uh, at least half the staff are farmers or former farmers, and uh, all have pretty long experience in organic and sustainable agriculture. The website here has hundreds of resources on a wide range of topics. Um, every format you can think of, I think publications, podcasts, videos, webinars, searchable databases and blogs, and uh, especially good for um, beginning farmers, but also we, we can help um, experienced farmers as well. So now I really appreciate uh, every time I listen to Dr. Bali's presentation, uh, learn something new. And that's important. Uh, what he and other presenters today are talking about is, is really important. You know, irrigation water volumes need monitoring uh, irrigation systems need to be maintained for effective use of our water resources. Uh, drip irrigation, micro sprinklers, subsurface drip, uh, that all these technologies are important. Uh, soil moisture monitoring, that is critically important. And, you know, looking at evapotranspiration, these are all parts of the toolbox, but I think in our focus on kind of technology, um, sorry, um, the focus on technology, We've kind of ignored uh, soil quality and soil health. And, you know, if your soils are not in good shape, uh, you're not getting efficient use of all that irrigation infrastructure and, and uh, the investments that you put in. It's like putting a $100 saddle on a $10 horse, you know. Uh, so, And the problem is, I think we're working mostly with a degraded resource. Uh, this study, it's, it's kind of an old study, but they estimate uh, about three quarters of the ground in the US, particularly in the Western US, is degraded. And that degradation is due to lack of organic matter. And lack of organic matter has a lot of 
kind of follow on consequences. It increases the compaction or compactability of that soil. Um, and then also it uh, creates problems with infiltration, water storage of those soils. And then uh, in the West here, we have uh, a growing problem with salinity. So, um, sigmas coming down the pike, uh, groundwater withdrawals will likely be restricted. So, uh, and the idea of well managed soils, they infiltrate, store, and cycle water and nutrients way more effectively uh, than poorly managed soils. And the fact of the matter is, um, we've been kind of ignoring soil ecology. And so, and soil ecology really is what drives soil function, uh, including its large impact on water infiltration and storage. And the fact is, uh, we are, our soils are not prepared for the stresses that uh, climate change is going to bring on. And I just want to show you a short video I took uh, a few days ago. Uh, let's see here. Hold on a second. Okay. Okay, now there's several, several caveats with this video. Um, one, on Sunday, this past Sunday, uh, we had this atmospheric rainstorm, at, atmospheric river come through uh, the central California area. Sacramento recorded the largest one day rainfall, uh, 5.44 inches uh, ever, since uh, records have been kept in starting in the 1870s. I live in Woodland. Um, this is my neighbor. Uh, he's an almond grower. He leases out his ground to bullseye farms. Um, sorry, um, we're not able to see your video. Um, well, it's not going yet. C can you uh, see the visual? No, we can't see anything right now. It's just a black screen. Oh, shoot. Well, let me try and. Might be your share screen. You might need to click a different. Um... Well, I, I optimized for video, but um, well, let's see. Nothing showing? If you back out of, uh, close your share screen. So stop your share screen for a moment. Yeah. And then go ahead and go back to share screen. And when the pop-up comes up, there's a little box that says optimize for video performance. Right. Well, I've done that. I've done that. Uh, did you click okay. both boxes? Yeah, I did. Okay. <laughs> it could okay. be. It's just, it's just not going to, you know, I did this on. Uh, it's, it's up now. Is it showing? Yes. All right. We're going to start calling you Jimmy Neutron. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me see if I can get this to run. Um, if you click on, oh, yeah. If you click below, like on the actual where it shows you're sharing your screen, you can move that to the top. You should be able to hit that. Oh, button. right. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Because it's. I'm probably there you go. Okay, so some caveats with this. Um, this is my neighbor. He leases his ground. Uh, I'm going to show you my backyard. I don't have to make money on my backyard. Uh, I have an orchard of kind of diverse fruit crops back there, but um, I don't sell them. I just eat them. Um, and I've put in cover crops for the past three years. I haven't tilled my soil in the last three years. Um, last year, in woodland area, our normal rainfall is about 18 inches. Uh, last year, we got four and a half. 
And so the cover crop didn't really do very much. Uh, I do irrigate around the trees uh, with an upside down sprinkler system. Um, but uh, so those are the caveats. Uh, but I just want to show this. All right. We're at the October 24th having about a four or five inch rainstorm. This is my neighbor's almond orchard. And they keep it pretty, pretty bare. A lot of uh, rainwater built up. And it's ponding, it's not infiltrating. Running off someplace. This is my property. Not to say that I've managed it just great, but you notice there's plants in the ground and there's no standing water at all, even though it's a couple feet lower than my neighbor's property. So you'd think, you know, there'd be a bunch of runoff onto our property, but there's very, very little standing water here. Even in the non-irrigated areas, the green areas are irrigated. That's where the uh, orchard is. But even in the places that aren't irrigated, I've kept the, um, the roots in the ground, not live roots, but dead roots, very little standing water there. And here, it's nothing but standing water. Cover crops or even resident vegetation is a good idea. Okay. So like I'm saying, you know, there's some caveats with that, but um, I think we need to do better if we're serious about infiltrating and recharging our water tables. <clears throat> we need to get better at managing where the water meets the planet. You know, that's the soil surface. Um, what's the cost of ignoring soil ecology? Well, you just saw it, you know. And um, today when I was driving by my neighbors, there's still, you know, large, large pools of water on that ground next door. Uh, it's not, the infiltration rate is like millimeters per hour, I'm sure. And um, so poor infiltration of rainwater and irrigation water. Uh, if we ignore soil ecology, uh, we're not going to recharge our water tables. Uh, and the water capacity, water holding capacity of the soils will improve if you just treat it as an ecology and add organic matter. Lack of nutrient storage in the soil, soil erosion from wind and rain about 10 days ago, you know, not this past Monday, but the Monday previous. I watched a bunch of uh, soil blow from Sacramento Valley down to the San Joaquin Valley. We had, you know, 25, 30 mile an hour winds and there was, it was a, like a dust storm. Um, and on the right, you see, this is typical of a lot of the soils and in, in some of the orchards that are kept real clean. Um, there's a seal that forms, a clay seal that forms on the surface. Uh, not only does that prevent water infiltration, but air infiltration is severely inhibited. You start getting anaerobic conditions in the root zone and that facilitates a lot of plant pathogen infections. So uh, kind of a lose, lose, lose situation, uh, not managing for soil, uh, soil health. And the only reason I'm showing this diagram is sand, silt, and clay particles. What, what aggregates them together is what drives soil function. And this aggregation only happens in biologically active soils. There's the glomalins that are uh, secreted by fungal, uh, uh, fungal mycelia. Uh, there's 
bacterial polysaccharides, which also act like glues, and they aggregate the soil, these soil particles together. And when you have good aggregation, you have good infiltration, uh, not only of water down into the root zone and then ultimately into the water table. Um, but if you don't have stable aggregates and you, you know, and what drives the aggregation again is biologically active soil. And what drives that is having sufficient organic matter so the biology can exist. Unstable aggregates uh, are a result of, you know, I think poorly managed soils. And when you have poorly managed soils, at the first sign of water, especially rainwater or irrigation droplets, not so much drip irrigation, but you know, micro sprinkler and, um, and rainfall, you get that seal on top with the clay particles, then you don't have much uh, infiltration at all with the rainwater or irrigation water, and you're not getting air filtering down into the root zone as well. And the runoff, probably carries uh, a bunch of clay particles, which is sediment into surface waters. And it's probably taken, um, the clay particles probably have some phosphorus adsorbed onto it. And um, so you're losing money as well as losing soil and uh, contributing to kind of algal blooms down and downstream somewhere. So uh, kind of, what happens at the surface doesn't stay at the surface. Good soil structure, you have infiltration. No soil structure, no infiltration. And uh, soil structure, it really is um, mostly driven by the soil biology, soil ecology. So payoff, it's just kind of the opposite of what I was talking about earlier. You have better infiltration of rainwater and irrigation water, you have increased storage capacity of the soils because the organic matter is much, has a much higher capacity to hold uh, moisture than the mineral content. Clays hold a lot of soil moisture, but they hold it pretty tight. You know, the organic matter is uh, more amenable to providing uh, moisture to plants. Increased and improved nutrient cycling because you're building up a reserve of uh, organic matter and there are nutrients in that organic matter. And decreased soil erosion from wind and rain because the soil aggregates, they're stable aggregates, and um, you know they're not easily picked up by uh, winds, even high winds. Uh, it resists compaction as well. And um, I've talked to many farmers, uh, almond farmers, as well as walnut growers, depending on how you do, uh, say, cover crops or adding organic matter. Uh, walnut growers uh, have decreased, dramatically decreased nematode problems, Pratolinchus nematode problems in their uh, walnuts. Um, root knot nematodes can be a problem in walnuts or almonds. Um, and uh, I've talked to growers that by adding organic matter, getting more checks and balances in the system, because you have a healthy soil, that's one of the most complex ecologies on the planet. And so there's a lot of predators, parasites, all kinds of stuff going on underneath your feet. And if you help it along, uh, it'll help you. So, um, some ways to do that, chipping prunings, um, alternate rows, you know, like one year, add prunings to one alley, next year to alternate alley. That works uh, quite well. Uh, cover crops, especially on new orchards, you know, there's a lot of bare ground uh, and it's been disked up and uh, really exposed to heat um, and Surface temperatures on California soils in the uh, in the middle of the summer can get up 130, 140 degrees, you know, and the soil microbiology really doesn't like that. Your tree roots probably don't like it either. Um, 
and especially with new orchards, you know, like uh, that top picture, that's in a walnut orchard. Uh, that fellow probably harvested that. That was, um, looks like a wheat hay, or he could harvest that as a wheat hay crop, you know, and sure, taking off some of that biomass, uh, you'd be better off for the soil to leave that biomass in, but, you know, you can harvest that and then the, that wheat crop roots are in the soil, helping your soil biology. So cover crops uh, contribute to better infiltration, adds organic matter. The roots of the cover crop, of any crop you have, even weeds, resident vegetation, you know, uh, they exude organic compounds, up to 50% of all the photosynthates that those plants um, create are put out through the roots. They're not, it's not leakage either. It's, it's to support a microbiology that helps the plants access a much larger volume of the soil uh, to access nutrients, access water. So compost, it's uh, probably the easiest way to kind of kickstart your soil biology and uh, your soil health. Uh, there's good cost shares these days, CDFA. I'll talk a little bit more about the CDFA cost share, but uh, CDFA will cost share up to six to eight tons of compost per acre at 50 bucks a ton. And their application will go live at the end of this month or early November. Uh, it's well worth your, uh, and no cost share cover crops. They, what they've taken is, um, they've kind of taken NR, a lot of NRCS cost shares and then kind of duplicated them. I do think that, uh, I think their co compost cost share is uh, a little bit better than NRCS. Anyway, so compost, um, really good way to uh, increase soil quality, uh, depending on how much you put in. And, you know, I've worked in the Modesto area. I haven't worked in the Madera area so much, but um, I've taken a lot of soil samples in the Modesto area. And there are some really sandy soils there. And sandy soils, you know, they don't, they tend to infiltrate water more easily, but they sure don't store it very well. And adding organic matter, you can increase that uh, water storage capacity. And also, sandy soils tend to be more um, subject to nematode problems because the nematodes can uh, travel through the sandy soil uh, more easily. And, uh, by adding organic matter, you can kind of put some checks and balances in that soil ecosystem that uh, parasites and predators that prey on the nematode populations and keep them from getting out of hand. So a little bit information about nitrogen. First thing, um, CDFA at, uh, and FREP, the Fertilizer Research and Education Program, have put together a pretty good website. And there's a dozen and a half uh, annual crops. Uh, they provide fertilizer guidelines for uh, about nine perennial crops and a dozen and a half annual crops. So First step is, you know, make sure you're not over applying nitrogen. Uh, you know, it's it's an unnecessary cost. You don't want to over irrigate too, because you know, then you're going to irrigate the nitrogen right past the root zone. So um, this is a good start. Just check and see what they have to say about almonds or um, avocado, um, and pistachio information, walnuts too. So all the nut crops are in there, and. Uh, it's good information. And irrigation and nitrogen management plan, you know, uh, I think most of you folks probably have to deal with these things. Um, and the irrigation water, uh, you know, there's some places in the Salinas Valley that you could bring up a crop of lettuce with just the nitrates in the irrigation water. I don't think it's quite as bad in your area, but the eastern side of you know, Stanislaus and uh, Merced counties and maybe Madera too. Uh, it's uh, pretty high nitrate concentrations in some of the groundwater there. So um, 
it's in parts per million or milligrams per liter. It's the same thing. Uh, and you can get these, uh, get them from your uh, various sources, local district testing, maybe your RCD uh, provides uh, testing services. You can send it into a lab. Uh, you can use other sources. You probably want to uh, test your irrigation water uh, a couple times a year just to see if there's any variation in the nitrate concentration. And if you're into um, doing your own calculations, you know, this, this equation, I mean, it looks a little bit complicated. It's not really, it's just converting from metric into our units of measurement. So if you get uh, your report of, you know, 10 parts per million, say, uh, that's milligrams per liter, same thing. And so you have 10 milligrams per liter, you multiply that times 3.78, that gives you milligrams per gallon. That's milligrams of nitrate per gallon. And then if you multiply it by the next number, 27,154, that will give you how many milligrams per acre inch. Well, that's gallons per acre inch, but that will give you milligrams per acre inch. And then if you divide that by that last number, 453,592, that's how many milligrams per pound. So by doing that, you'll get how many pounds per acre inch, okay? Pretty simple equation, it looks more complex than it is. But if you're not into doing equations, uh, there's other ways, you know, there's a lot of tables uh, you can access on uh, the on the web. Uh, it'll just give you, uh, if, if your nitrate concentration is say uh, in this column, you know, 15, 20, 25, uh, you can look up how many pounds of nitrogen you're applying in, you know, X number of acre inches, okay? Very simple to do. And if you're applying someplace, if you're reports come back, uh, say 23 parts per million, you know, you just interpolate, you know, average five and six pounds per one inch of, um, of applied irrigation water, and that comes out to five and a half, roughly, you know, and a lot of this stuff is, is pretty ballpark, you know, so keep that in mind. Um, Right, the Management Practice Evaluation Program has a website, has a nitrogen calculator for irrigation water. Uh, you can go down here. Uh, you can download uh, an offline calculator. So it's an Excel spreadsheet. You can put in uh, your levels of nitrate, um, how many inches of water that you're using. You need to put in your estimated efficiency too. Uh, it defaults to 100. I don't think anybody here has 100%. Uh, I heard 90% earlier. Typical, you know, somewhere between 70 and 90% is probably typical, but you have to put that in. And it'll, will, it will calculate uh, the N in applied water. And uh, some of these other spreadsheets down below, uh, you can uh, figure out if you have two uh, sources of irrigation water, say surface and well or two wells, um, it'll do that for you. So that's a pretty handy dandy way to uh, figure out your irrigation, uh, how much nitrates or nitrogen you're applying in the irrigation water. And plus you, in your nitrogen budget, you need to figure inputs as well as removal. And um, so for almonds, I didn't do this for walnuts or pistachios, uh, but I'm guessing one of your farm advisors probably knows uh, some, something about this or, but you know, for almonds, it's about 68 pounds of nitrogen removed per 1000 pounds of corona. So if you get a report back from your processor, you know, you had 2,500 pounds uh, in your per acre or, you know, how many ever pounds over your, 
how many ever acres in your block, you know, you can figure out just some simple math, um, how many pounds of nitrogen were removed and put that in your report. Um, keep in mind also that your trees, they're growing and that they will take up um, pretty significant amounts of nitrogen. You know, uh, nine to 13 year old almond trees, uh, they take up about 25 to 30 pounds per acre of nitrogen. So you wanna include that in your calculations as well. Other inputs, you know, um, pretty much, you know, there's not, uh, there's not a whole lot of soil reserves uh, as far as nitrogen goes on, unless you count what was, you, you know, applied in the previous season that wasn't um, irrigated past the root zone. But, um, so what you apply is kind of what you get except for compost and cover crops. And those are a little bit trickier. And we're gonna be talking about that. Um, and it's the directions in these uh, for the nitrogen management plans, you know, applied organic amendments should be reported as the amount of nitrogen available to the plant during the crop year in pounds per acre, not applied, but available to the plant. And, uh, the deal is uh, with organic materials, you know, you have this carbon nitrogen link that you don't have with uh, chemical fertilizers. And so you put on chemical fertilizers, you know, what you apply, you get that amount of uh, nitrogen or ammonium uh, or nitrate. Uh, but with organic amendments, because of that link with carbon, uh, they have to be metabolized by the soil ecology. And so that, um, well, what you apply, what is put into the ground is not what's gonna be available to the plant. So for example, for compost, um, if most composts uh, generally have about a 1% nitrogen level, but, uh, if you are applying compost, ask your compost supplier for an analysis. Generally, they will provide one. They'll be able to tell you uh, even what the NPK levels are. Um, problem in California is uh, compost suppliers are very reticent about putting any kind of label on their compost because if they put in and analysis on their compost, then they have to sell it. They're subject to the mill tax uh, and it being sell, sold as a fertilizer. So, uh, but I think if you ask, generally most of the suppliers will know what level of uh, nitrogen they are using. So for example, if you are applying five tons per acre uh, of compost, which is not excessive, I don't think it's a, it's like you're investing in your soils, right? That's 10,000 pounds, sounds like a lot. Um, if you broadcast it, you know, this grower in this picture, uh, that, that's a smart way to apply it because it's going directly into the kind of the drip line of the tree. And uh, that's where a lot of the um, water absorption by the roots take place. Anyway, 1% um, nitrogen, times uh, 10,000 pounds would provide about 100 pounds of nitrogen. That's applied, but it's not available to the plant, to the, in this case, the almond crop. Only about 15 to 20% will be available to the almond crop. So that's, you put down 15 or 20 pounds. Um, now the other nitrogen is in the soil. It just hasn't uh, been metabolized. Uh, it's, you're building up a reserve in the following years for nitrogen as well as organic matter. So uh, it's not that you lose it, um, it's just, it's not available to the plant for the following cropping season. The cover crops, there's something similar, but uh, you know, you, you can directly measure uh, how much compost you're applying, but you can't really directly measure 
exactly to cover crime. And I'm going to talk about it. You can you can send you can send a sample of your cover crop into a lab for analysis. Uh, but keep in mind, you know, that sample, you know, you, you, you should talk to the lab for specific directions and, you know, how you want to take that sample. Uh, what I'm going to be talking about here is a lot more ballpark. Uh, and what you do is kind of figure out the wet biomass, uh, have an estimate of uh, what the dry weight of that is, and then figure, you know, have another guesstimate of the level, the nitrate, nitrogen level in that dry matter. So I use a two foot by two foot square. Um, generally take a few samples because the more samples you have, the better reflection that your sampling will ref better reflect um, what is actually happening with a cover crop. Uh, so cut all the vegetation um, and you can see this fellow has a bag, that's what I used. Uh, you wanna weigh the bag first, just so you're not uh, including that weight into your cover crop calculations. Take a few samples um, and then, you know, keep in mind, this is gonna require some math um, and you folks are all farmers. So I'm assuming you have experience in math. Um, it's 43, 560 square feet uh, and so, in this sample or this example, the average weight of the three samples is 1.5 pounds, okay? So you wanna figure out how many of those four square feet samples you have. I mean, four square feet units in an acre. Uh, so you divide by four and you multiply times 1.5. That gives you the wet weight of the cover crop. 16,335, sounds like a lot, and it is a lot. It's over eight tons. Um, so uh, here's a little table. We're gonna use about 15% dry weight, right? 85% of the cover crop, especially if you harvest early in the season, kind of like the way most almond growers would do if they had a, a cover crop. Uh, it's going to be pretty lush and full of water. So multiply the weight of the cover crop, the wet weight, by 0.15. That's you know the percent of dry matter. And you end up with a figure 2,450 pounds of dry matter per acre. That guesstimate, um, and these are all ballpark, right? But it gives you something to start with. A guesstimate of the percent N of this cover crop uh, is about 2% nitrogen. You know, there's, there's mustards in there. There's actually, you can't see it, but there's a vetch and bell bean. There's legumes in there as well. If you have more legumes, you know, you want to bump that up to maybe 2.5%, maybe up to 3% if it's a pure vetch or pure legume cover crop, right? And um, if it's all cereal, you know, triticale, you know, that goes down to like 1.5% maybe. But there's a lot of variables uh, with this too, depending on the time that you chop the cover uh, and if you incorporate it or not. But anyway, so back to the 2% um, times 2,450, uh, that gives you, okay, that's my, Sorry, that's my alarm. I have five minutes left. Um, so I'll finish up here. So you have about 49 pounds, maybe 50 pounds of nitrogen per acre from the cover crop. Um, only about half of that uh, nitrogen will be available to the fallen crop or the trees in this case. Uh, so you figure about 25 pounds of nitrogen will be available to the fallen crop. Like I said before, the nitrogen doesn't disappear, you're building up a reserve, but it's linked to carbon. So it's gonna have to be metabolized by the soil microbiology. And the cover crop plant available nitrogen, it, it'll vary uh, with the species, with 
um, kind of when you chop the cover, uh, when you harvest the cover, and you know, say over here, you have oats and vets, you have a 26 inch canopy. It's mostly, mostly oats, it looks like from this picture. It's 26, that's a lot of biomass. Here, it's not as big, only 20 inches. It's rye, vetch, and peas. But this is a younger crop, right? So this, you have 155 pounds total nitrogen. That's a lot of nitrogen. And of that, you have 60 pounds plant available nitrogen, which is what you would put in your report. Over here, with this uh, small grain, which generally, the small grains generally have a higher carbon nitrogen ratio. There's more carbon relative to the nitrogen available. There's 110 pounds, that's, that's a pretty good crop. But there's only 10 pounds of plant available nitrogen. So, you know, if you have a lot of small grains in your cover, you, you want to um, get a feel for, it may be a good, good idea to uh, send that into a lab to just get an understanding of like, okay, if I have a 50-50 oats and vetch cover, what kind of nitrogen am I getting at the time that I generally want to chop it? Um, but once you get that, you know, you can kind of do a ballpark estimate as well. And um, like I said, there's a lot of variables involved. If you have pure legumes, you know, you're gonna have uh, a lot more uh, nitrogen, plant available nitrogen in pounds per acre than, you know, if you have a straight triticale, you know, which is kind of the beginner's, uh, beginner's cover crop, I'd, I'd say, you know, the, the learning cover crop, um, you might get, 10 pounds per acre. You want to be careful because the later you wait to chop that, the more carbon you're putting into the ground. You're not losing the nitrogen, but the carbon increases relative to the nitrogen. And so you're going to be essentially sucking up carbon from your soil or asking the soil to supply carbon that you have not applied unless you throw on some fertilizer to uh, help digest that, that cereal with the high carbon uh, nitrogen ratio. Like I said, you're not losing the nitrogen, but it's being sequestered by being you know, linked to the carbon to help the bacteria that is digesting some of this stuff and the fungi that are digesting. For example, um, and I'll finish up here in just a minute or two. Uh, in this example, say we had 50, 50 pounds total in that um, cover crop example, right? Only about half of that was available to the plant. This other half here, that goes down here into the subsequent year. And what you're doing is you're building up reserves and so in year two, if you put in another cover crop, you know, you'll have this amount of carbon or this amount of nitrogen, you know, 25 pounds, plus some fraction of the previous year, which is not going to be, you know, this is where the guesstimation comes in because um, there's a lot of variables that are involved with the mineralization of the organic matter that you have in the soil. Um, and I'm not going to give you any figures, but you're going to have to just uh, get a feel for that. You know, if you're adding um, cover crops every year, you can be assured, you know, there's going to be two or three or four pounds, maybe up to eight pounds, maybe 10 pounds, depending on your, the level of organic matter in your soils. Um, but if you do this every year, you start building up these big reserves down here you know, and that's carbon reserves as well as nutrient reserves, particularly nitrogen. So I've already talked about CDFA's Healthy Soils Incentives Program, um, cover crop, they cost share, compost is a good cost share, um, hedgerows, they have a lot of different mulch of various kinds, um, NRCS uh, also has cost share uh, through EQIP, in, uh, environmental quality incentives program. 
Uh, and also in California, there's uh, one of about a 13, 14 states. Uh, NRCS is offering this new soil carbon interim uh, practice code 808. Uh, that'll cost share application of compost as well as you know maybe biochar or uh, some other heavy carbon resource. So take advantage of the cost shares uh, to improve your soil and uh, invest in your soil. And that's that's it. I think I finished on time. Thank you, Rex. Are there any questions for Rex? Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Rex. Mm -hmm. um, Thanks for listening. If you have any questions, just you can email me. There's my email right there. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So next we have Dominic Yes, I'm just quickly. You guys have mad after me, and I should be able to stop. Yeah, okay. So, my name is Dominic Christina with NFM. I uh, got asked to come and talk to you guys about system maintenance. And, and uh, about your irrigation systems on micro irrigation systems. So that's kind of what I'm going to be concentrating on. Um, show of hands in the room, most of you guys, what, what are you growing or where you're growing interested in? Are you looking for almonds, grow crops, everything? Almonds, white grapes. Almonds, white grapes for the majority. Okay. So, it's in the middle, right? On the forward one. It's um, so on the side. Okay. So a couple things you can go over is like key conditions that you want to look at. Um, no, I'm back. Oh, is that ready to run around? I think so. There you go. There it goes. Uh, your system design, um, regular maintenance that you need to do, um, your system maintenance that you should do for yearly, be more annual stuff, and the system components maintenance, what you're looking at. So, you know, I've heard a lot of different things of what, of what happens throughout the field, you know, applying different chemicals, um, taking care of your soils. All those things, but a lot of it comes down to also on your drip irrigation system that it's properly designed in the beginning and it also is properly maintained through the years. It'll make you more money if it's properly maintained and if it's properly designed. So when we're looking at that type of stuff, um, we're going to first understanding your drip irrigation system. So one like we already heard from several other uh, things today was about your soils. So we're talking about the soil and what we're looking at in there. What we're looking at when we're designing irrigation system is really understanding what your soil is made up of, what your infiltration rate is. Because if you put too much water on than what your soils can handle, no matter what condition they're in, then your infiltration, then the water will not go down. If water doesn't go down, that's not useful to the root system. You're not taking your nutrients down there as well as the water. So then, then you're looking for um, puddling and the have evaporation and be a waste of your time and your pump money, as well as your water, which has become uh, obviously more prized in California through a lot of years. So that again comes back to your soil makeup. So if you've got either sand, clay, sandy loams, if you've got, uh, like Matt talked about, he's got a, a real sandy strip that runs through his piece of property, you can actually make your system understand that, design it so that you have a different output in those areas and the way you spread the water out so that we can maximize that soil and you're not just wasting water or wasting your time or wasting pump uh, energy as well. Since we all know PC likes to charge quite a bit for water these days to just pump it out of the ground. Again, the other thing is understanding your water source. So where your water's coming from is real important. So if you've got well or surface, 
um, if you've got a max of both. If you're also looking at um, testing your water, you want to know what's in there. You got high bicarbonates. So if you got high bicarbonates, do you want to apply acid? It'd be no, because it actually solidifies and will make it solidify inside your emitters. And then you have like a white gel in there, which will plug everything up. Um, you also you know if you want to add acid to you change your pH. If you want to look at chlorine because you have a lot of organic matter, or if you want to go to our natural with like a uh, hydrogen peroxide, which is C2O certified, so that it actually has higher activation rate per per gallon, but it will be cost you a little bit more. But um, it's something else we can look at or a combination of both the blind cleaners or how to do uh, a lot of push out in here or have root protrusion or something like that. So that's why testing your water is really important. Also by testing your water, you're gonna find out what your sustainable solids are, which is what your solids are that are, that are, that are held in the water. That obviously makes you understand what kind of filtration you want. So if you want to run a screen, if you want to run three-dimensional three filtration, like a disc or a sand, or if you want to just run um, no filtration at all, depending on what you're, what you're applying it through. And then third would be your gallons per minute, or four, sorry. Fourth would be your gallons per minute. So what you're looking at there is, can you actually apply the amount of water that you, that you need for your, um, for your crop? So if you don't have enough water for, say, almonds that need 3.5 acre feet, then do you plant almonds? You know, uh, do you have enough water that year for tomatoes, but not for permanent crop? It's all the stuff that we see a lot of people trying to push and push and push, but then they wonder why their, 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 their product they have out in the field is not performing. So understanding what you have in the surface, what you have under the ground, and what you can apply through water is real important to understand if you can actually do the crop that you have, that you have in mind in order to produce off of. The other thing is what you hear is when you're doing this is, what's the reality of what you need in your area? You know, you have uh, the, the crop averages, you have the soil averages, but really understanding where you are in a specific area and the soils will allow you to understand if you can actually apply and, and produce what you're looking for. So to go from there, we go to the system design. So the system design is pretty simple. You know, you've got your, your uh, water source. So you actually have a pointer, I thought. So you have your water source, obviously, well, something of that nature. Um, you have your filtration which in this case is right here. You have your um, emission devices, which is either gonna be a, a micro sprinkler, in our case, a, a, a micro jet, or a drip line, which is a bitter, or a punch on emitter. And then your run times. Your run times is also really important, especially as we go through this time of watching PG change around the flex has actually made it easier. I don't know if you guys know the on peak and on peak, on and off peak has actually changed, made it a lot easier for a farmer. It's just only four hours for you to Three hours a day that you can shut on and off and you have two full days optional to see if you opt into the program that you can run 24 hours straight all on off-peak hours but as soon as you touch that little bit of on-peak then you get charged for that on peak oh. Oh. All right. <laughs> so your systems are you know become a system performance you know you want to maintain your distribution uniformity we talked about 90s pluses um, when systems are designed, they're always going to be up in the 90 plus range. That's what we're looking at doing. Um, either a PC, which is pressure compensating, or a non-PC. DU, just, I know if I'm telling you guys rudimentary, I apologize. But DU is distribution uniformity, which is how evenly the water is spread out over the whole system. So when you look at that, that's where you want to be up in the 85 to 90%. But what does that difference really mean? So what can really affect your DUs is one is runtime. Uh, if you have if you have a higher you know, if your if your DU is down to 85 compared to 95, you're going to have to run longer to put out the more uniform water. That's just as well. So you're going to be either pushing things past your root zone, or you're not going to be applying enough if you're just trying to match it. So understanding what your actual DU is is very important. So you get it obviously when you first put in a system, and like was recommended, you probably want to test your system every year to every other year to make sure it's maintaining that. It's something you can pay somebody to do, or you can learn how to do it yourself by going to ITRC or the CIP at Fresno. They do do courses that you can go learn how to do it individually. It does take a lot of time to make sure you know what you're doing. So that is also important when it comes to nitrogen management. So if your DUs are off and you're applying your, your too much water, too little water, then your nitrogen is not going to be put in the root zone. So especially if you're talking about an almond, which has most of its feeder roots in the top two feet, 85% of them. Now we talk about a grape, you're looking to actually cover the full five, you know, the full five foot basis all the way down, usually pretty even roots that, that feed off of those. So you have a little bit more leeway on a grape. Um, but almonds, which has been our most cash crop throughout the valley, and which most people are planting, 
it's real important to understand where you're applying and putting your water and your nutrients. So you want to make sure that if you're again applying, you want to make sure your nitrogen is at the same water. Sustainability. Now this has become a fun buzzword for us in that, but uh, there's a lot of things around this, but mainly what it comes around to is water. I mean, we cannot grow without water. So we want to make sure that if you have a higher DU, it makes you more, it, it, it can <coughs> sustainability higher if your DU drops a little lower. And then we have the ultimate ROI, which is your return on investment. So just a quick note, if you drop 10% in say an almond orchard on your DU and you don't affect and you don't actually know that. So you're still applying thinking you have a 92 or 93% DU and you're applying it and it's actually 85, that can affect you up to about 400 pounds to the acre. And the reason I will do that is because you're not gonna be giving the water evenly to all the plants. And so when that happens, they're not gonna ripen at the same. So then you're gonna have nuts and sticks. They're gonna have wind up with the mummy. So then you have to come back and do even more aggressive shaking in the end. So you don't want to cost yourself just the $400 an acre on what are 400 pounds per acre. That one season, it's going to keep going that way until you understand what you need to fix on the system or that you start irrigating correctly to what your system's capabilities are so you make things more even. Then on top of that, you have your mummy shaking, you have more labor, you have the increase in diseases and other things like that. So it's real important to make sure that when you look at these systems, it doesn't only affect just applying water, it affects the livelihood of whatever plant you have. Um, um, is DU easy to, um, can we, can we do DU? Yes. Do, is it, what, and what is it, me, how do you measure DU? So that's why, like I said, there's classes that, like, if you want to take a quick class, there's a, a, a one day class over at ITRC in, in Cal Poly, giving excuse to go to San Luis for a day or two, um, if you like that kind of stuff. And then you can go over there and you can, and you can look at it and they go through the full class. It's not a difficult system. It's a little bit time consuming, just, you know, for measurements and pressure and catch can and stuff like that. And, doing it at various places, but I've done it throughout my career when I was farming and I've done it uh, on the other sides of where I've been. So it's, it's not very difficult to do, but it's pretty simplistic, but it just takes a little bit of time. Okay, other things that can affect your DU. This is actually one of the number one things, or I said number two. And that's operating outside of the way that the system was designed. So a lot of a lot of farmers, and I have this happen quite a bit, um, and Matt did too back in his previous <laughs> days when he worked as a uh, for Western, um, is that you'll design a system to be a two set system. So you have two blocks, you have to run independently in order for it to be to be to put out the proper amount of water and be properly pressurized. Well, when the plants are young, like oh, never mind, I'm just I don't need as much water. I'm only going to put on turn on the whole thing and just run. It. Well, if the pressures aren't right, the system's not balanced, and that'll make your DU crash. And I've seen this a lot, and that's very unfortunate on a newer orchard or a newer vineyard, because that's the most crucial time to get that plant started. That's where the roots are the smallest, and it's really crucial to keep that water right next to where you want it to be at the root zone to help it expand it out. So that's why it's always a key to always run these systems the way they were designed. So again, it goes back to larger sets than they were designed and running at the proper pressures. So another fact that we've seen is people have turned down their VFDs because they want to save a little bit of money, which is a variable frequency drive, which is an adjustable motor, or the old original, which is a diesel. We throttle back the diesel, right? Because, oh, we don't need to put out as much. I don't need that much pressure. Again, the pressure is designed in order for the system to operate correctly. One of the major factors of pressure is your filtration system. You want to make sure your filtration system has a proper pressure to back flush if it's an automatic system. Again, if you go out into the field, your pressure compensating emitters need so much pressure for them to seep so they work correctly. Most of your, your drippers are going to be anywhere from uh, 8 to 10 pounds. Now, when you get to a spinner or, or a sprinkler, most of those are actually up at 25 pounds. And that's not at the valve, that's at the end of the line, which means it needs to be at your farthest point from the pump. That's the minimum pressure you need. The reason that is that's so the diaphragms will seep. And they'll start doing their job, which is pressure compensating. They use that pressure in order to make sure the water is always the same coming out. So again, this type of this type of stuff can actually affect up to twenty percent, and that's that's where you can really see some huge variance. So if, again, if you're designed around ninety percent, ninety five percent, and you're only you're not getting all this stuff done, then that can happen and affect you all the way. Now, the number one culprit though is that maintenance. That is the number one culprit of what actually makes people's DUs drop. So in that idea, do we maintain things? Do you guys brush your teeth today? Mm -hmm. Cool tool. You know, do you take a bath? 
You know, we don't cry during it. You know, do we play? Do we do exercise? Do we eat? Do we clean our pools? Do we take care of our spas if we have one? Again, our vehicles. You know, I've never seen one farmer hesitate to put money back in the truck to make sure the oil's changed or to put brakes on their truck. But if you ask them, hey, did you flush your lines this week or this month? Ah, I just do it once a year. You know, so that's the stuff that really makes you really makes you think about it. Now, all this stuff, even down to a tractor, can cost one hundred to one hundred fifty thousand dollars, right? A harvester can cost two hundred thousand dollars. We make sure those are extremely important and they're taken care of properly. Our irrigation systems cost us anywhere from fifteen hundred to three thousand to four thousand dollars an acre. They're a very expensive system. They're also not maintenance free, so it's real important to make sure we take care of that maintenance. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> okay, so what needs to be maintained? There's actually three, about three major focuses to really look for of how you do your maintenance throughout a year. First is going to be your startup maintenance. Then you're going to have your in season maintenance, and you're going to have your year end maintenance. That's it. Well, it's kind of funny. I think the year end used to be a lot more aggressive than it used to be. It seems like we're always moving out, basically 12 months out of the year. But you know, if we ever really have a true winter with a nice hard freeze, it'd be nice. And then you have your winterization. <clears throat> Okay, so system components require maintenance. Um, oops, we're going backwards again. Go back there. There it is. Okay, so it requires maintenance. It's going to be everything: your primary filtration, your pressure relief valves, your chem, your check, your chem check valves, your air vents, your main lines, your sub mains. And finally, your dripper lines or emission devices. There are a couple lines that are really forgotten about that's kind of disappointing that are really important to your system that people always overlook. And the two primaries are going to be air relief and your and your uh, and your air vents. Those are two that really make a difference. Uh -oh. Can we freeze it? <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna click to the next slide. Okay, so primary filtration. So how many of you how many of you use San Media? We'll start there. Okay. Screens. Screens. Anybody use disc? Use disc. I use everything. Yeah. <laughs> You're not loyal to anything, are you? I guess. Okay, that's perfect. <laughs> so we'll start with the easy. So uh, we look at filtration maintenance. You got your startup maintenance. So what that is after you come off the season, right? It's been a nice winter. We got 10 and 12 inches, 14 inches of rainfall. We had you know a couple of weeks months of freeze, so the flies and the mosquitoes are finally dead after four years. It'd be really nice for you know, one year to have that. So you're going to start up. So you really want to make sure that when you first start up, that everything works. If you have sand medias, open them up, make sure they have sand inside. I know it sounds stupid, but it happens. The sand is what the media is in order to do it. If you have discs, make sure they didn't sit all winter long in something and that they weren't clean. And so that way, they're if they're full of algae and full of scum when you first start, then they're going to have problems. Same, same if you have a screen. Screen and are the same. You want to make sure they're clean. This is really easy. You get a high pressure watch. You, you go right on, the, right on the system. For screens, you pull the screen out and clean it out if it, if it had a problem. Either. Then when you first go to fire up, make sure everything works. All right? So these, most of these systems, actually all of these are automatic. So when you're going to fire them up, make sure the backflow system works. Make sure the solenoids work. Make sure your pressure differential works. Pressure differential is the most important thing if you're going to walk away from your system. Because that's what that automatically makes it back flush if you get a difference between the inlet and the outlet pressure. If those don't work correctly, you could have 65 pounds sitting on top and out in the field. We already went over what happens when we have the problem out in the field. So that's why it's real important to make sure they work. Now, for your disc, your disc filtration, you're looking at probably changing out your disc every seven to nine years. And that's because the discs over time, they're plastic, they rub on each other, they wear. If you look at a screen, if you're not on an screen, just a basic screen, you just want to make sure there's no holes punched in it, no gaps, nothing pushing out from sand or anything else pushing out, or there's not a lot of sand lodged in it. And that over time, you have to look at replacing that. If it's an automatic screen filter, you want to make sure that there's no rubbish and that the bearings are working correctly. Those bearings can all be replaced about every other year is what you're looking at on a bearing on an automatic screen. When you get to sand, which is probably our most robust and, and best filtration we have out there, it's a three-dimensional. So the only three-dimensional filters we have in, in agriculture right now is sand or disc. Everything else is two-dimensional. Our screen is just a flat surface that it goes through. Screens are more of water polishers. So if you have a lot of sand startup on wells, which I find this is going to be a, a, a 
Because usually sand becomes a problem off the wells. Wells drop, they start pulling harder. So when you look at screens, you only take about one to three parts per million of sand before they have problems. Discs can take up to five to seven parts per million of sand before they have problems with it. And that's because then the sand gets lodged between the discs and it doesn't let the water, it lets bigger objects go through. Sand meeting can handle up to 10 parts per million of sand. So it can handle a little bit more. So there's a way that you can work with, with us or, or your local dealers that can come out and help test that for you to see what's going on. Now for proper sand, sand solutions, you're looking anywhere from three to seven pounds or you need to go through that before you get through your system. Again, something to remember when you're looking at your pressure and how much balance you have. I know there's a company in town trying to get some Monero pump that can help you make your pump bigger too. <laughs> um, so the most common thing I get asked on sand is how often you drop your sand. So you're gonna to wanna to change out your sand every, every five to seven years. The reason that is, a sand when it's really put in is actually angular, so it's real sharp, okay, it's silicon. Over time, it rubs and it rubs and it rubs and it becomes smooth, like a stone, like a river stone. But what that does is it makes your filtration tighter than it needs to be, which means you're over filtering and you're actually gonna be wasting water and more backflush. So every five to seven years, you're gonna to wanna to drop it. Now I get the question all the time, what about I add new sand on top? Well, that's nice, that means your sand on top is doing its job correctly, but the sand on bottom is still filtering harder than it needs to. So that can create you more issues. The other thing to really look at when you open them up every time you start the season is dig down and see if you can find a layer. So kind of like in soil, if you guys have ever developed ground, if you ever find a layer, what do you have to do? You usually rip it to break that layer up. Well, you can't really rip a sand media tank. So if that layer of mud or gut or organic matter is deeper than six inches in the bed, you're going to need to drop that bed. It's not going to come back out no matter who sand media you use. They're all designed to very similar. They're all pressure vessels. So it's something important to remember on sand that you're going to have to drop that and do that. That usually is more common when you have a surface water uh, application, you get like a glug of mud or a glug of sand, just to push back down under. So if your pressure differential is not working correctly, then it's not that flushing out. All the simple things to make sure. Yeah. It's working uh, normal, regular. How much speed is she adding in the end of the year? If it's set correctly, maybe a bag of 50 pounds. If you're overset, and where you get that set point is, is on your back flush throttling valve. So it'll go throughout three or four inch back flush. That valve should not be open more than three and a half cranks. If it's open more than that, you're letting too much of your sand flow back out. Okay. That back pressure is important in order to pop and lift that bed and stir it without the bed leaving. Okay, so during the season, again, go by and just make sure it's working. You want to open them up every now and then if you, if you feel like something's not right, you need to make sure that they're working correctly. Two is when you have your automatic backlash, sit there once and hit manual and watch it go through every single cylinder because if it's not, then you've got one tank that's not working correctly or one disc pack that's not working correctly. Or in a screen situation, it's not backlashing at all. So there's something that you want to make sure that you're doing that. Also during the season, on all these, you usually have a little command filter, right? A little three H tube that comes off, got a little black command filter. You want to clean that at least once a week because if that's dirty, the water doesn't go to the valves, then the valves don't backflush. So it's very important stuff to do through the season. In the season to winterization, this is some old tricks I like to do on my farms. Um, if there's, you know, look at your individual manufacturers, but when I I typically, especially on sand medias, will start there. I'll take two gallons of muriatic acid. I'll turn the pump on, fill the system up, shut off the valve that's right below the filter so the filter stays full. Shut the pump off. Open the top of those, uh, open the top of those sand medias and you find that they're still full of water, okay? You take two gallons of muriatic acid, you pour them in a 48-inch 40, 40 tank, you bolt it back shut, and you let it sit for about four hours. What that'll do is it'll break up all the organic matter in there, eat it up without damaging the wall of your filter. And then you can go ahead and do a power flush at the end. You fire your pump back up, pull back up, put a little more back pressure in those tanks, maybe like 60 pounds and run through a back flush. That'll break up and loosen everything out. Then you shut the system down and can go to bed for the winter. And that actually helps prevent anything from, you know, sitting on the sides, eating away, really finding your sand. It'll help break it up and let it run better. Uh, when you go to your disc, you want to take the, take off the covers of the disc, get a high pressure gun out, loosen them a little bit, and spray them down the of spin, get all the stuff to fling off and it flings off and that way they're done. This so what acid I use neuronic acid. You go to home depot, you get in a two-pack of gallons for your cerebral. It's real simple. Um, again, for your screen, pull the screen out, high pressure, clean it, slide it back in, and then you're done. It's kind of your end of season winterization, pretty much the same thing. 
Oh, no, on winterization, sorry. What else you want to do if we're in cold situations? We're in California, so not really. But um, if you're in cold situations, drain out a little bit, pick up air, an air vent, put on that 3 8 line and punch it through and drain out your air lines. The, the, sorry, the, the water lines that fit to your solenoid. So that, and that line is about 3 8 right? But that little pinhole that goes through that solenoid is very, very small. So if you can get all that air out of there, you'll be fine. Now we do occasionally have a 15 or 16 or 20 degree freeze that can actually freeze that inside your solenoid and pop the solenoids. Those will cost a couple hundred bucks or hundred bucks to fix. So it's something just a little preventative maintenance if you, if you want to do it. Okay, things like this. I know it's kind of hard to see, but so this is a backflush valve, and then right there is a uh, a nice rock that's sitting right there. So you get those inside of your backflush valve, stuff like that. I don't, I'm still not sure how I took this picture. I'm not sure how that lock went through the pump, but it did. And so that's simple things you just want to look for. So take apart, make sure if any valves are sticking, just look for them. And then all these valves usually have a shaft. So if you have the valve open anyways, take a little marine grease, wipe it down that shaft and keep it clean. Don't use a, a petroleum base, you want to use a marine or a silicone base because that way it doesn't eat it, the gaskets or anything like that, it just does what you're looking for. Okay. So I'm going to go back to the one thing I always think is always, you guys are going to hate me for this, but so you guys know what this thing looks like, right? You guys probably have a lot of your systems, the Chevy 57 Chevy spring thing we got. That's, they don't work. Okay. I know there's some micro, micro manufacturers that would hate me saying this, but I, I, these things are ridiculous. If you can ask anybody, because what they do is in order to make them pop is say your, say your system is an 85 PSI system before it gets real, so you have to set 75. What's well, a spring? So you have to keep adding pressure to that thing to keep making it open more and more, which means you're still increasing the pressure on the system. So that becomes a problem. Also, if you drop the system, that part, that's a spring. So it's going to slam it shut. That creates water hammer, which means you just shove a lot of pressure down in your system, which can have also catastrophic issues. So my suggestion is go for hydraulic style valve. The difference between the two of these is like 150 bucks. When you look at the size of the system, it's really, it's cost you pennies on, and less than pennies. But it's extremely important. What's nice about them is you can adjust them. You can test them. They always usually have a pressure gauge. You can put one next to it. So throughout the season, again, a lot of maintenance is you take that, you leave the lock that on there and you screw it down into it and you'll watch it blow off. And then you screw it back out to where you had, where you had your mark. So it's set back at your 70 PSI. That's so you know they work, but these are designed as soon as they hit their pressure, they full board open. And then when they go below that pressure, they slowly close. And that's easier on the system. It's a lot safer for the system. Oh, I forgot there's animation. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, if you want. So they look like that, right? They come in black or black, they come in plastic or in metal, uh, depending on the size you want. And they'll be sized. So talk to your local dealer who you deal with. You can ask them, hey, you know, I got a four tank system, I got an eight tank system, what should I have on there? Do you need a two or a three inch? Real important, real easy, really overlooked. If you ever want to see one that's never worked, it's pretty easy. Go right side of filters, and if they don't have a straight wall on them, they're a little bit rounded, that means that's, those tanks exceeded their pressure max because something didn't blow off. 99% of the time, if one of these is there, it doesn't blow off, see it. Now, if this is there and you go to test it, it doesn't work, then that means you can. Pull it off or have it fixed or get it fixed so that way it always does work. I've actually seen these guys that were set at 75 pounds go over 150 before they ever blow off because they kind of rush up. It was a great technology when it was designed, but you know, things have improved. Okay, the other unsung hero and the most forgotten about part of your system is the airbed. Okay. Start up. When you start your system, everybody's heard the air vents, they're blowing air out. It's real important they blow the air out. Does anybody know why it's important they blow the air up? So they blow the line up. Thank you. You must have done this before. Once. Or twice. <laughs> so what they're there for is the fact is get the air up. So if you if your air vents are not working correctly, if they're plugged with something and you're and you're firing the system up and you've got 45 pounds of water rushing down the thing and there's nowhere for the air to go, it compresses, it compresses, it compresses until it explodes. I've actually seen 15 inch lines explode 36 inches below the ground because the air vents didn't work. It's a fun hole. But it doesn't just affect that one spot. It cracks that pipe all the way back two to 300 feet back. Okay, simple thing, just making sure they work. During the season maintenance, again, when you're firing up, just make sure they're working. 
So in the off season, when I usually do it and our people do it, is that they go around and make sure airmen's are clean. Pull them off, you inspect them. Almost all of these guys, well, are, are serviceable. So this guy here, which we've all seen a lot, there, there's there's different parts to them. I, I prefer more of these two, which is a continuous, which means it lets a lot of air out, but once the system's up and running, it also purge air that comes through the system. These the, the metal ones that you see here, the challenge goes is, there, is that ball is so light that it'll actually shut before water comes out of it, which means you still let air in it. So if you have a really fast pump and it's really pushing hard, you're gonna shut that with still a lot of air in it. The other thing, classically, what people do here, and if you look at a lot of pump guys, which Matt, I think, has all of his fingers. But they'll traditionally take their finger and they'll push down on that ball. If you want to look at a lot of old pump guys, they're kind of missing the tip of their thumb or a little bit right here because they do that and then it slaps back on their finger. And I've seen it. It's not, it's not fun. So that's only make sure that you keep them clean, but you also be safe around. Winterization is like, again, when we pull these things apart and take a look at them if you're concerned about it. During the season, you can always pull it apart, you know. And the way you really see the classics, especially these guys over here, you're continuous. Uh, whatever. These two guys over here is because they'll spit water continuously. Just always, you'll see a little green, green stuff coming out of them and that kind of stuff. That's when you need to make sure they all have like a slide inside of them that moves up and back. You just want to open them up and clean it. Another trick you can do if they've got a snorkel that can turn upright is you turn that snorkel upright. You take a 10 to 1 solution, one part bleach, 10 parts water. You pour it down in there, you let it sit for about 10 minutes, and then you roll that snorkel back over. What that'll do is it kind of eats away a little bit of the uh, of the organic matter that's built up, and then that'll help free it up, and then it'll clean out. You should always have the snorkels facing down because if you have them up, when you shut the system off, if there's water there, it's going to sit in there. When it sits in there, then it makes organic matter, then it makes them not work correctly. Okay, so it's simple stuff like that. So there's a real one. And this happens a lot, <laughs> especially around filter stations. Sees the loss, the, the bees, and then when it gets there, nobody wants to touch it. They need to clean it. No, I'm not doing that. So, you know, everybody wears a can of loss spray or stuff like that. They're, they're stuck, but that's a Christmas class. I was actually taking it right out of my water. Then we have our filter stations. Oh, no, sorry. Our main lines are pipelines. We are the air filter stations. So, your sand lines and mains. Everybody kind of flushes them once every now and then and kind of walks away. So there's still debris that builds up in your main lines and your submarines, and they need to be flushed. So when you first start up, it's always good to open not all of them, because if you open all of them, you're going to get enough flow and pressure everywhere. So you want to start kind of at your mains, right? Open your main first. And there's always a fun thing when people start. They start and they, and they open it up, and it flushes out dirt for like a second. They go, okay, I'm done, and they shut it back down. So with that part you're getting for that first sack is remember that's for, that you're, you're 32 to 48 inches of cover on top of that. That's just that little bit that's stuck right there. You want to open them, wait another 30 seconds to a minute, make sure it's still running clean. A lot of times what happens is you'll get that first shot of dirt and then it'll and then it'll, it'll go away and then you'll see another shot of dirt coming out after it's built up in your lines. Extremely important if you ever have a break. You want to make sure you get this out because after that filtration system, you don't have any more filters when you're going out to your field, except for what's on your emission device. So the more big debris you can get out of the way, the better. Is that your backyard? No. <laughs> no. So then you go to your submarine flushes. This is in beautiful uh, Yuma, Arizona. Um, so these are these are just nice submarine flushes that are set up. So you, you want to use some main flushes. Again, your main line of some you want to flush every time you start up. I know it makes a little bit of a mess around there. It takes about a minute to two minutes per area, but it's real important to keep your system clean. Um, now, it also depends on each individual system. If you go out there and you know, the first two times of starting up or four or five times starting up, it's always clear water, then wait a little while. Okay, this is not exact science. It all, it's also depends differently. It's just how each one of us are different. So each individual system is designed for your individual farm. So there's going to be different characteristics. But you want to get in the practice of doing a little more maintenance instead of not doing it at all. So imagine if you only brush your teeth once a week or, you know, you only ate. Like I remind my kids, you're supposed to feed the dog every day. And like, oh, I forgot today. I'm like, cool, but we won't feed you today. I mean, there's, there's, there's simple things in life that you just have to remember. You either have kids, know what I'm talking about. <laughs> 
Um, <laughs> it's, it, it, okay. So we come to hydraulic valves. So usually in between your sub and mains, you, you'll find hydraulic valves. Um, these are usually helped to set, to balance your system on your mainline pressures, to balance how things go out. If you have a non-pressure compensating system, they're even more important because they're to balance the water everywhere across your, across your field because your emitter is not going to do it for you. So on these guys, the same thing. You want to make sure they're working. Check on each side to make sure the pressure is there. You want to make sure that they... Um, that you clean the lines out in the winter. Again, not so much for the pilots, but more for the cylinder if you have an electric system, if you have an automated system where you're doing things that are out there. The pilots have a little bit bigger orifice, but you wanna make sure that they're working correctly. Your pilot, all the pilots, you all know, there's dial of pilots, there's the bolt screw down pilots. They all have a vent tube. When a pilot is reacting, you need to let air in or out of the bonnet, which is the part on top, which allows the water to base on what you wanna do. If you go by that, that system and that thing is always pushing water out, then you have a problem somewhere. Or if that pilot, or if the system's not reacting at all. The first culprit I ever find every single time I get called out to the field is the vent tube is plugged with either bugs in it or mud in it. So that vent tube is really crucial. So before you rip apart the valve thing, there's something wrong, clean out the tubes real quick. <coughs> That's where most of the purpose are going to happen. You need a little bit of organic matter in there, a little bit of rock or something like that, or on the vent tube especially, you get stuff that's built up in there. The critters in the winter love to hide, and it happens the same way up on a filter station. You've got the, you have the valves there, and they have a vent tube. I've actually had a guy call me. He's been working on the system for three hours. Very experienced. He was frustrated. He was like, I moved the valve around. I've done everything, and it just keeps happening. And I said, you clean out the tubes? He goes, yes, but you clean out the vent tubes? You, I'll call you back. And I got a text two minutes later, he goes, I don't want to talk to you anymore. Because that's what it was. He was on that thing for three hours. So just remember when you're working on all this equipment, start at the simple things. It's kind of like we all call the cable guy. He goes, you should turn the power off if you're not stupid. But it, it needs to be done. Start at the simple things, right? Or when, or when your phone doesn't work, it, was, it just won't work. The complex thing is you shut it off, turn it back on. Uh, same thing here. So during in season maintenance, again, making sure they work. Don't assume because it turned on for the last month all the time that it's still working exactly the same. Either you or your irrigators haven't trained to go by, just oh, yeah, pressure's at 25, where it's supposed to be. A lot of guys do little tricks on that pressure gauge right there. They take a Sharpie marker, a little piece of paint, and they put it right where they want it to be. So that way they don't have to stare at it. Remember, they can just go by, go, yep, it's set at 28, yep, it's set at 30. So that way it's a simple eye reference. So you guys can go on and do other things. You know, just like your irrigators in the fields, you got other things for them to do, but if they can do things simply that makes them go by and do it fast, it's right, then it's easy. But if it's wrong, then you can fix it. And you know you need to fix it. <clears throat> so end of the season and winterization, again, the same thing. When you're shutting the system down, make sure you clean them out. You know, just, just pull the tubes off and blow them out, do something like that. We're a little bit easier here again because we're, we're in the Central Valley. We don't get really hard, hard freezes, but our guys, like Sam, Pacific Northwest, I've actually seen these things like separate because they didn't you know, clean them out. And that's metal too. So again, we look inside, this is stuff that's inside the bonnet. So when there, when there is stuff that's not reacting correctly, you, you, it's usually six or eight or 10 bolts, depending on the size of your valve. You can take off the bonnet and look inside. Don't be scared of it. All that's inside of all these is just a rubber and a spring. You can open them up, find the debris, clean them out, put them back down for something not right. Uh, that's the one thing that's really simple. There's not a lot of real complicated stuff here. Now for valves, so there's there's different apps. I know we have an app for NetFM for our valves. So if you hit that, it's a it's online. It's the NetFM app for valves. Is NetFM USA valves? So you can download it. And what's nice about it is it has all the schematics. So if you start taking a valve apart because you have something wrong, you can't remember how to put it back together. You can call your local dealer, or in our case, you can just look up the app. I think most of the other companies have a similar app. That you can look up and then all the plumbing is right there so you plumb back correctly. Because just missing one little T or something the wrong direction makes everything go kind of and that, that is very frustrating. I've been on that situation. So your triple lines or your emission device, even if you get micro jets. <coughs> There's simple ways to flush. There's all sorts of ways to do it. But how do we really want to do it correctly? So if we're going to go on a heavy wall above ground. So when you're looking at any of this, either your micro sprinklers or on, or on your or on your uh, drip on startup, you want to make sure that the system is running. Make sure it's a pressure up. You don't want to flush your drip lines until your full pressures come up on your system. Okay. 
So when your system's up and running, then you're going to want to go ahead and flush it. You should always flush at the beginning of the season, no matter how you shut it down. Because through the winter, things got in there, things happened. Um, a lot of your pipes will dry and whatever debris was stuck on the side of them can drop back down. Your binding units on your on your uh, chemicals that you've been injecting will have gone away through the winter and they'll, they'll let stuff free up. So the way you should really flush a drip, drip line is you should only flush from the T1 direction. Okay, because I have guys do both. You should never open every single one of them up because you lose your pressure and your velocity. You need the velocity in order to clean the stuff out. You need the pressure in order to shove it all the way out and your flow. So you usually should open, and my best rule of thumb, again, everybody's ranch is slightly different, but this is the best rule of thumb, is open 20 lines at a time. And typically what you do is you have one person start in the beginning, if you can do this, if not, it's a lot of double blocking. And when he gets to number 20 or she gets to number 20, they kind of whistle back to the person at, the, at that time to start, and you just open and close the same, you know, when the person starts closing, the next person starts opening. So there's always about 20 open. And don't, I've seen guys just that are running, no, just at a nice slow pace. And the reason you want to do that at a nice slow pace is that gives you enough time for that water to get from the team all the way up. Okay, and by doing that, I and mean, I've been on a lot of fields where a guy goes, I got plugging, well, how do you flush? I start here and I go all the way around. You open them all? Yeah, so let me guess, your plugging's over here. How'd you know that? Well, there's no, there's no flow. You, know, you never plug on this side, do you? No, 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 it's always great. So you want to make sure that you, this is, this is a rule of thumb, okay? The other thing is you shouldn't be flushing your, your lines every 150 to 200 hours of operation. So on your peak, you're looking about every three weeks. When you're off peak, it's not gonna be as often. It's a rule of thumb. Open them up, look how much debris comes in your hand or put it in a plastic bottle and see what's there. Again, it's not the initial, like, you know, for, we always open trying to get that initial boom. Like, oh, look at that. Well, that's what's been sitting at the end of that line all the time. But when you leave it open, you see how constant it gets after about five, 10, 15, or about 15 seconds, then you should really start looking. Usually it takes about a minute to two minutes, but it, that's where you're gonna see where you wanna make sure you clean everything out. It's real important. Uh, in season. So we all inject chemicals through our, through our stuff, right? Well, you wanna make sure that you clean your chemicals out. So this is a simple way to think about it for uniformity. When you apply your water and you start injecting chemicals or, or, or Fertilizers, where do they go first? To the far side or the front side? They go to the beginning. So, as you, so say you, you put an hour of water on first because you want to pre-wet the soil. And that allows the, 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 everything to move into it. So then as you're running, say you run for eight hours, and then you're going to shut off your chemicals. You want to run another hour and a half after that. The reason is, is because the clean water is going to go to the front side first to clean out where you had your chemical go first. It's going to go to the far side last to clean out the chemical labs. It actually makes your chemical applications more balanced to make sure that you are putting pre and post water on. And then you let it sit. One recommendation I always recommend is then skip an irrigation after that. The reason it is, or two later, is you want to make sure you get your, your chemicals and stuff set right in the root zone where you want it. If you just keep applying more water afterwards, what are you going to do? You're going to push it past it. So you want to make sure that you're putting your chemicals on. They're not cheap because they're not going to get any cheaper. Uh, if anybody's been talking about anything. So you wanna make sure that you're applying it and then you're using it. And then you can clean it up. So that's why it's real important to do that. It helps balance what you're applying and also helps keep your system clean. Simple maintenance. End of the season winterization, you wanna make sure you do a nice good flush at the end. If you think you've had a lot of binding, you know, if you've got a, a lot of organic matter, I've seen on fields where you go by an emitter and you see green like growing out of the dripper, it's always a good thing to look at either uh, a chlorine injection or at the end of the year do a shock treatment. Just make sure whatever you're applying is not going to affect your root zone of what you got out in the field. So if you got tomatoes or something on the ground, make sure what you're applying because you're directly in the root zone. To make sure you're doing what, you're, what you can. Talk to your local PCA. We have suggestions to help clean our line. It makes our lines right, but sometimes what we want to clean out with and what matches up with your product, what you have out in the field is not identical. So you want to make sure you have a nice balance. So again, with something like hydroperoxide works really well about eating up organic matter and usually followed by a little bit of acid a day or so later, we'll out, punch out whatever we did to punch out. So I kind of like the old school basics, but that's just me. Um, okay, production agriculture, which we're all. So what happens when magnets is you know, neglected? It's pretty simple. Simple, your, your performance goes down. Your uh, your system uniformity goes down. Your yield 
goes down. Your revenue goes down. Your net profit goes down. That's it. Ah. That's all tied to your sustainability. <laughs> it's tied to your sustainability. <laughs> so, you know, farmers are kind of the original, you know, I like to think of it, and I might be wrong, and I've had some environmentalists to argue with me, but we're the original environmentalists. You know, we need nothing we can do is without the environment. We have to have water, we have to have good soil, we have to have clean air. That makes our that makes our products better, that makes us go to market easy. So just remember when you guys are out with maintenance, if you want to be a sustainable farm, which means you're still around next year or the year after that, or for your kids, that you have to make sure you're balancing everything. So it's real important to make sure we're doing that. So, and then we get to the other part of it, the sustainability. If you're looking at um, going into the future here, when you're going to pull out and, and take, your, take your system out, there's lots of ways to recycle everything out. You've become a lot better about that. I mean, there's a lot more plastic out there. If you think of when we were putting stuff in the ground 25 years ago, you were doing it. <laughs> Compared to now, how much more drip is out there, Matt? <laughs> it's an incredible amount of drip. It's been really utilized on a lot of things. We want to make sure that we're going to use that stuff other places. So it's real important that we can actually recycle that and we have places to put it. And you're probably going to start seeing that show up more and more in the products you're going to be purchasing too, because we have to have a net zero. So resources you guys can look for. Um, at netfinusa.com, there's all sorts of downloads for maintenance. We have maintenance guides. Um, we have the valve app. That's what the little icon looks like. If you want to look at that, there's also hydraulics on there that help you think about if you have the right valve in there. Um, there's tech support teams. And then finally, there's the, the product, ma product management and field agronomy team, which is myself as a part of it, and uh, Jonathan there in the back. If you guys have any questions, he's the local guy that runs around between Fresno up to uh, Sacramento. So there's a lot of people you can have around here. Um, any other questions on maintenance? Yes, Pat. Dominic, what kind of pressure difference have you lost? Is that old saying that like, losing the angularity after five. It's a, it's a good question. So, so when your system first fires up, you should be losing about 1.5, 2.5 PSI across it, right? As your system goes on, if you keep having to change your pressure differential up to like, you know, if, if you're set at seven, so that we have about five pounds for it to work. If you're set at like seven or eight for it to backflush on, next thing you know, your guys are putting it at 10, 11, 12, because it just won't run that often because it's backflushing all the time. Then that's something you need to look at and what your sand is. The five to seven again is a rule, but if you're back flushing more often than every three hours or every two and a half hours continuously, then you need to probably look at your sand or what you got going on. You could have dirtier water coming in. It could be that it was not, you might need another filter tank. You know, a lot of us design this stuff on what we do on, on averages and, and estimations. And if you don't get a good water source, then sometimes you have to add a filter tank or something like that, or your incoming source is changing. So something of that nature to look at. Any other questions? Don, we're going to have to have you uh, do that all over again on tape. <laughs> it was really informative. It was really uh, So I hope you guys, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Appreciate it. You guys have a good day. Thank yeah. you. Okay, so we will break for lunch. Yeah. And so since it's 12 8, I uh, will take a 15 minute lunch. So we can begin back at, um, let's call it 12.35. We'll, we'll start at 12.35. Take my thing down now because you probably don't need it. I'll just make sure that Matt's sound is okay and then, and then I'll turn it off. Yeah. All right, good afternoon, everybody. I think they're ready to get this show started again. I think you guys are all probably itching to get out of here. So I'm going to take a couple minutes of your time and then I'll turn it over to Matt. So my name is Christina Beckstead. I'm the executive director here at Madera County Farm Bureau. Um, I was asked by Amy and Mark Hudson, who sit on the um, RCD, well, Amy who runs the RCD, and Matt, who is part of the board, I'm not sure that, or um, I'm sorry, Mark itself part of the board, um, to talk briefly about a new program that as a farmer you're going to be impacted by if you're not already. Um, so all of you, I'm assuming, know what the Irrigated Lands Program is, right? Everybody pays the East San Joaquin Water Quality Coalition for dues every year. Okay, so last year, if you lived in the Chow Chill area, you got a bill 
that had an extra cost added to it. Um, if you're in Madeira, you haven't seen that cost yet, but you will be seeing it probably late next year, if not in the beginning of 2023. So the State Water Board has launched a new program. It's called the Nitrate Control Program. Many of you have probably heard of CV Salts. That has been an ongoing salt nitrate program uh, or discussion, I should say, for many years, for probably 10 to 15 years, they've been working on this CV salts thing. Well, as a result of their efforts in CV salts, um, the nitrate control program came to be. That came into effect last year. And so what happens is, is that the nitrate control program is a solution for those water wells, domestic wells that are impacted by nitrates. So a year ago, two years ago, you were all required to test your domestic wells. Right. And I think most people have done that. And if you chose not to do that, you're probably providing bottled water to that house because that's the only way you get around this. Right. So for those that tested their wells and chose not to provide bottled water because you're not required to, but you um, told or notified whoever's living in that home that that water is not potable. The nitrate control program is the solution to that. Right. Because you everybody wants to have clean water. So what happens is, is that if you have a domestic well that's high in nitrates and there's no water being currently delivered to that house, the nitrate control program can provide water for that program. So right now we're doing a lot of outreach in an effort to get to residential homes that are impacted, potentially impacted by nitrates. So we have a grant in Madera County um, through the Regional Water Management Group that allows us to pay um, and there's no cost to any of this, to any of you. So right now, what we have is a grant that allows us to test um, these wells. But if you're in the irrigated lands program, we can't use that for that. That's your obligation. But if there's a resident that has a well that needs to be tested that is not a farmed land, we have grants. We have a grant place to pay for that testing. And then we have this program, the nitrate control program, that is providing bottled water to those. Um, homes that are impacted by nitrates, nitrates in excess of 10 MCLs, MGLs, MCLs, MGLs, um, milligrams per liter, right? <laughs> so um, this is just a little bit of uh, just kind of a brief, very brief overview. Right now it's going on in Chowchilla. So Chowchilla was priority one. Um, when I say Chowchilla, it's kind of El Nido, Chowchilla, and a little bit of Madeira. It's not the Sigma boundary. They're using some old boundaries, some old mapping that was done under Bulletin 118 in 2003. So um, unfortunately, our, our lines don't match real well with um, those of you that are familiar with Sigma, what's going on there. Um, but if there's a question about that, and if you're curious to know if you're in that management zone or whatnot, then um, let me know. When you get your bill, so Madeira is priority two. So we've been able to push the state water board back a little bit. The state water board will probably not release notices to comply for priority twos until late next year, which means once that notice to comply comes out, we have 270 days to submit a plan on how we're going to address the drinking water situation. So um, right now, Chowchilla is completely underway. That bill that you get, that extra charge that you see on your ESJ bill. So I'm wearing two hats right now, three hats right now. So I'm former executive director, right? I'm ESJ board member and I'm Chowchilla management zone um, administration. So um, when you get that bill from ESJ and you're like, whoa, why are you charging me $3 an acre on top of my $4.25, right? And so what that is, is that as a applicator, you have a waste discharge permit that the coalition holds for you. So as a, <clears throat> under the waste discharge permit requirements, you as a farmer, and it's not just the farmers, the dairies have got to pay it, the manufacturers have got to pay it, the, you know, everybody, everyone that has a waste discharge permit, the cities, they all have to pay into this management zone program, nitrate control program. And so that is your share of what irrigated land is responsible for. So when you get the bill, you're going to be upset. There's going to be questions because you're not going to remember this conversation. Maybe you will, maybe you won't. 
Um, but when that time comes, give us a call. For those of you that are in the chat, Chowchilla, you've already seen that bill. You're going to get another bill this year for Chowchilla. It's going to be lower than what it was last year. Um, but that bill is probably not going to come until maybe February. But this program is crucial for us to meet the requirements as an industry and as waste discharge permits. So not just agriculture. Like I said, this isn't just agriculture that's paying into this. It is, it's, it's everybody that holds a waste discharge permit, but it's crucial for us to do this outreach and talk to these people and get these wells tested and get water provided to them um, for us to meet our obligations for the safe, affordable drinking water that the state is trying to work and move forward. Boom. Yeah. <laughs> Boom. Uh, I know, I'm the bearer of here all the time. The, uh, the waste permit that the South Water Coalition holds for yes. us, yes. Have, have they always held that for us? Yes. So, so, as, so, that, so that dollar's been coming out of their pocket, yeah. which is ultimately our pocket. So this program just launched. So new pocket. Yeah, it's a, pocket, yeah. so this is a new program it just came into they came in we came out last year um the east san joaquin helped put up seed money right because they had money that they collected from all of you kind of still sitting in reserves we divided that money up um based on acreage to the different management zones and they paid some of that money out so that we could make this program start. But now that it's up and running, we know how much the program roughly that we're, we're headed into year two. We know roughly what the program is costing us, then that bill is getting charged now to the growers. Yes, Mark. So like we have a chemical permit to apply chemical or pesticides. Correct. Being a part of the ESA is our permit to apply nitrogen. Otherwise, if we're not part of the the ESJ, we don't have a permit to apply nitrogen fertilizer to the soil. That is correct. Technically, Technically yes. So, um, yeah, so as an irrigated land holder, there's an irrigated lands program, ILRP, and the, each of the coalitions up and down the valley, I know Mr. Boss is part of Tulare, right? Like they hold the permit for all of you to be applying nitrogen fertilizers to your crops. Technically, you're not supposed to do that. I've had a few members that have tried to do their own permit through the state. And it is almost impossible to do. I mean, it's the, the, the cost associated with it is absurd because of all the testing and the monthly requirements and just it's a mess. So that's why you all belong to the ESJ or are supposed to be belonging to the ESJ. And if you're not a member of the ESJ, I highly recommend that you join because they are cracking down and they are finding those growers that are not involved. And the penalties associated with it is up to $1,000 a day per day. To the state so this three dollars yes. be a reoccurring cost yeah but it'll change based on the budget needs yes mm -hmm. so the chowchilla the chowchilla fee this year was three dollars and 38 cents roughly 33 cents um this year we're working on the budget but we it we fix, we anticipate that it'll be a drastic drop in that fee and i will tell you on the esj side um, I have worked really hard to get that board to be transparent and to sharpen their pencils. Um, and you will not see a dues increase this year for, on your ESJ bill. And if all goes well, you will you will hopefully see a decrease next year. So, any other questions? Hey, yes. Is that I tested for three years in a row. It's been real low here. Then I'm exempt for five years. From You're good. Yep. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Okay, there's a lot of information. Thank you for your time. Amy, thanks you for asking. Mark, thanks for thinking of me. Después de la reunión, si quieren hablar, yo puedo explicar a usted. Gracias. All right. Have fun, guys. <laughs> yeah, to that, I just say dandy. I mean, at the end of the day, we talk about recharge. And one of the things that we're really going to struggle with, everybody just thinks that recharge is going to work. But Recharge is going, to, it's going to be problematic because we're going to go back through the soil. We're just talking about what the nitrates went into, right? But there is locked in with arsenic, so it's going to be the same problem. So recharge is going to be something that's just a little more unique than finding a lot. So, okay. Today I'm going to talk about, you know, real time information. And, and obviously, this is a company that that uh, is kind of one of our water system companies. And really, I, I don't want to even 
talk much about it other than the fact that uh, we we do data capture, right? And we do automation. So next slide, Pam. Or this thing, does it work? So I wanted to get to the the problem that, that we talked about, and everybody's been Dominic, everybody's talking about distribution uniformity, right? No. And uh <coughs> Which one? Oh, that top one, top arrow. Oh. On the side. On the side. Yeah. It doesn't work. Try the bottom arrow. The one just below. <laughs> can you uh, can you just? I'll just I'll just say. <laughs> so so what I want to do is talk about distribution uniformity, and and I loved uh, you know the. The, the, the example we got of how long does it take to get to San Francisco, right? Uh, does anybody know what that is? It's, a, it's an MPBI field or a, a picture, right? And it's just looking at crop stress, saying, hey, you know, we're stressed. And, and the funny thing is, we think, well, there must be some variability in there. But at the end of the day, that's not variability, is it? It is in some sense. That's distribution uniformity because this is where the submain goes, and this is the end of the drip line. Submain, drip line, both sides. That's how systems are designed. So I had uh, my friends at uh, the Earth Labs at Stanford break out this resolution. 53% of it is green, yellow, and, and uh, orange and red. The red part from the green part is 43 acres. And I'm just assuming that 2,500 pounds are grown in that, that area. So if you took that 43 times 25 and you put $2 at it, 215,000, right? On that acre. At 21% or 17 acres, it drops, as Tom said, 10%. And we're looking at 38,000 pounds, right? In that area. 13 acres at 2,000 pounds, because as I move out, right, there's less water. Water and crop go hand in hand. And then it's 52,000. And then my, my last spot, does that say eight? Yes. Yeah, I must have. Oh, that's 8%, which is seven acres. And I dropped it to 1750, which puts me at 24,000. <clears> You total this up, right, in this block, and it ends up being, uh, let's see here, if I got, if I got 2,500 pounds on 80 acres, it'd be 200,000 pounds at $400,000, but because I had these drops in my production, it's 386,000, right, 368, excuse me. With a cost variance of 32,000, of what just uniformity does, right? So I think that's really important to note because at the end of the day, that's what we're talking about with distribution uniformity. To simplify it, it would be to say, well, right here in the green, I got 10 apples. Here in the, the yellow, I got eight apples. Here in the orange, I got six apples. And in the red, I got uh, four apples, right? So as that line goes down, the uniformity gets less, you have less crop, yes, less yield. So that's really important. What, what's most interesting about this is that the grower actually ran the pump off peak, which is when it's the cheapest uh, electricity time, right? So that's Friday afternoon till Monday at noon, right? 66 hours off peak. And so what happens is, how many other growers do you think run off peak? Everybody. 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 <laughs> right? What do you think happens to the groundwater during that off peak time? Well, I'm going to show you what happens. But at the end of the day, on a weekend, I watched I watched groundwater with a transducer drop by 40 feet, right? And if Groundwater drops 40 feet, it affects the efficiency or the, the design of your holes, your pump. So here's what happens. Let me ask somebody, how many guys got flow meters on their, their pumps? 
Everybody? Okay. And then with that flow meter, when you turn that pump on, you got a notebook. You write down how much water it's pumping. So in this situation, it's 1,200 gallons on Friday afternoon, right? What do you think happened on uh, Saturday morning? Everybody's got the pump on. It's 1,000 gallons, right? Distribution uniformly starts to reduce, right? By Saturday night, mm -hmm. we're down to whatever that is. Sunday morning, keeps going down. And by Monday at noon, I'm going to be down to 800 gallons, right? Now, how many guys check their flow meters when they turn the pump off? You do? That's yeah, amazing. Just, just, just for curiosity. And do you see the variance? Maybe, uh, you know, as well, but say, say we got a couple of starting to go 400, shut off time, they're about 325, maybe 330. Yeah. And, and where you start seeing that is in the flow meter, you watch the pressure reduce and the filters. Yeah, all you guys start scraping the gates down because your pressure on your tank starts dropping. So that's right. And that's they don't right. want to flush right. But because we're not recording it and we don't get data on it, we actually don't know it, right? So that's kind of what I'm talking about today is the ability to record information automatically, continuously, right? Every 15 minutes. And I'll give you an example. So I'll go to the next slide. Because I'm a I'm a pump guy, you know. Everybody says, well, I got a pump test. It was, you know, it was this and it was this efficiency. But pump efficiency and well efficiency are typically, they're not typically, they're two different things. A pump efficiency is the wire to water efficiency based on OPE, which is operating. Uh, efficiency, right? Well efficiency is how much water comes into the well, right? So if you've got water coming into the well, it's gauged by how much water per foot. It's called specific capacity, right? So specific capacity in most wells around here are about 30 gallons per foot, right? But let's use 50 as a number, right? So if I need a thousand gallons, it's 50 gallons per foot, it's a 20 foot drawdown, right? Turn the pump on, get a thousand gallons, draw us down. When this happens, and over the weekend, what happens, you start seeing this depression. But that well efficiency is something that we don't get to see, right? Because specific capacity is the well efficiency. Wire to pump efficiency is pump efficiency. I know that's a little interesting, but it is important to know. Next slide. So what we see is in these wells is that you know, it starts out here and it draws down to pumping water level. This is standing, right? Static water level. So this is the, what's it say here? The first 24 hours, get the next 48 hours. And you can see this drawdown occur, right? But what's interesting is it just doesn't affect my yield. As this well draws down, there's perps, perforations that allow water to go in here. So what, what happens is those wells basically go open, you know, they, they draw down past the perforations and they start to mineralize because, or biofoul. So mineralization is caused by this projection, projection of line, right? So out here, coming in here, down this way, the water comes in faster into the well. It's a little tiny point, you know, zero six slot. And as it enters the well, it creates an eddy, just like in a dripper. And it starts to mineralize. And actually, the bicarbonates build up and plug the, the perforations. When that happens, when this drawdown occurs, this standing water up here, right? This whole area is hydrated, meaning it's wet. And as this cone is empty, it's, it's left <coughs> open, right? Well, if you've got 10,000 pounds on both sides of a, a pipe and it's empty, what's going to happen? It's going to snap. And that's what happens. Wells break, and all those things occur, right? 
So the cost of yield is not just the problem, the cost of fixing this, right? But as this increases in, in uh, depth, it's crossing all these aquifers, right? All these layers. It's picking up more sand. As it gets in here, what's sand do to a pump? It knocks it out. Knocks the bowl shaft out first. And once the bowl shaft's knocked out, it creates a vibration in the, in the pump. It goes up through the tube and shaft, takes out the tube and shaft, and now you have a problem. All because we don't understand where this pumping water level is on a 66 hour run, right? So when the growers come to me and I, you know, they talk to me about what do I got to do? I go, we have got to have a strategy where we only run this pump for 12 hours. Now, if I'm 